chapter one of elizabethan sea dogs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org elizabethan sea dogs by william wood chapter one england's first look in the early spring of fourteen hundred and seventy six the italian giovanni cabato who like christopher columbus was a seafaring citizen of genoa transferred his allegiance to venice the roman empire had fallen a thousand years before rome now held temporal sway only over the states of the church which were weak in armed force even when compared with the small republics dukedoms and principalities which lay north and south but papal rome as the head and heart of a spiritual empire was still a world power and the disunited italian states were first in the commercial enterprise of the age as well as in the glories of the renaissance north of the papal domain which cut the peninsula in two parts stood three renowned italian cities florence the capital of tuscany leading the world in arts genoa the home of cabato and columbus teaching the world the science of navigation and venice mistress of the great trade route between europe and asia controlling the world's commerce thus in becoming a citizen of venice giovanni cabato the genoese was leaving the best home of scientific navigation for the best home of sea-borne trade his very name was no bad credential surnames often come from nicknames and for a genoese to be called il cabato was as much as for an arab of the desert to be known to his people as the horseman capitaccio now means no more than coasting trade but before there was any real ocean commerce it referred to the regular seaborne trade of the time and giovanni cabato must have either upheld an exceptional family tradition or struck out an exceptional line for himself to have been known as john the skipper among the many other expert skippers hailing from the port of genoa there was nothing strange in his being naturalized in venice patriotism of the kind that keeps the citizen under the flag of his own country was hardly known outside of england france and spain though the italian states used to fight each other an individual italian especially when he was a sailor always felt at liberty to seek his fortune in any one of them or wherever he found his chance most tempting so the genoese giovanni became the venetian zuan without any patriotic wrench nor was even the vastly greater change to plain john cabot so very startling italian experts entered the service of a foreign monarch as easily as did the pay-fighting swiss or hessian mercenaries columbus entered the spanish service under ferdinand and isabella just as cabot entered the english service under henry the seventh giovanni zuan john it was all in a good day's work cabot settled in bristol where the still existing guild of merchant venturers was even then two centuries old columbus writing of his visit to iceland says the english especially those of bristol go there with their merchandise iceland was then what newfoundland became the best of distant fishing grounds it marked one end of the line of english seaborne commerce the levant marked the other the baltic formed an important branch thus english trade already stretched out over all the main lines long before cabot's arrival a merchant prince of bristol named canning who employed a hundred artificers and eight hundred seamen was trading to iceland to the baltic and most of all to the mediterranean the trade with italian ports stood in high favor among english merchants and was encouraged by the king in fourteen hundred and eighty five the first year of the tudor dynasty an english 
consul took office at pisa and england made a treaty of reciprocity with tuscany henry the seventh first of the energetic tudors and grandfather of queen elizabeth was a thrifty and practical man some years before the event about to be recorded in these pages columbus had sent him a trusted brother with maps globes and quotations from plato to prove the existence of lands to the west henry had troubles of his own in england so he turned a deaf ear and lost a new world but after columbus had found america and the pope had divided all heathen countries between the crowns of spain and portugal henry decided to see what he could do anglo-american history begins on the fifth of march fourteen hundred and ninety six when the cabots father and three sons received the following patent from the king henry by the grace of god king of england and france and lord of ireland to all to whom these presents shall come greeting be it known that we have given and granted and by these presents do give and grant for us and our heirs to our well-beloved john gabbett citizen of venice to lose sebastian and santius sons of the said john and to the heirs of them and every of them and their deputies full and free authority leave and power to sail to all parts countries and seas of the east of the west and of the north under our banners and ensigns with five ships of what burden or quantity soever they be and as many mariners or men as they will have with them in the said ships upon their own proper costs and charges to seek out discover and find whatsoever isles countries regions or provinces of the heathens and infidels whatsoever they be and in what part of the world soever they be which before this time have been unknown to all christians we have granted to them also and to every of them the heirs of them and every of them and their deputies and have given them license to set up our banners and ensigns in every village town castle isle or mainland of them newly found and that the aforesaid john and his sons or their heirs and assigns may subdue occupy and possess all such towns cities castles and isles of them found which they can subdue occupy and possess as our vassals and lieutenants getting unto us the rule title and jurisdiction of the same villages towns castles and firm land so found the patent then goes on to provide for a royalty to his majesty of one-fifth of the net profits to exempt the patentees from custom duty to exclude competition and to exhort good subjects of the crown to help the cabots in every possible way the first of all english documents connected with america ends with these words witness ourself at westminster the fifth day of march in the eleventh year of our re reign henry r to sail to all parts of the east of the west and of the north the pointed omission of the word south made it clear that henry had no intention of infringing spanish rights of discovery spanish claims however were based on the pope's division of all the heathen world and were by no means bounded by any rights of discovery already acquired cabot left bristol in the spring of fourteen hundred and ninety seven a year after the date of his patent not with the five ships the king had authorized but in the little matthew with a crew of only eighteen men nearly all englishmen accustomed to the north atlantic the matthew made cape breton the easternmost point of nova scotia on the twenty fourth of june the anniversary of st john the baptist now the racial fete day of the french canadians not a single human inhabitant was to be seen in this wild new land shaggy with forests primeval fronted with bold scarped shores and beautiful with romantic deep bays leading inland league upon league past rugged forelands and rocky battlements keeping guard at the frontiers of the continent over these mysterious wilds cabot raised st george's cross for england and the banner of st mark in souvenir of venice 
had he now reached the fabled islands of the west or discovered other islands off the eastern coast of tartary he did not know but he hurried back to bristol with the news and was welcomed by the king and people a venetian in london wrote home to say that this fellow-citizen of ours who went from bristol in quest of new islands is juan cabato whom the english now call a great admiral he dresses in silk they pay him great honour and every one runs after him like mad the spanish ambassador was full of suspicion in spite of the fact that cabot had not gone south had not his holiness divided all heathendom between the crowns of spain and portugal to spain the west and to portugal the east and was not this landfall within what the modern world would call the spanish sphere of influence the ambassador protested to henry the seventh and reported home to ferdinand and isabella henry the seventh meanwhile sent a little present to him that found the new isle ten pounds it was not very much but it was about as much as nearly a thousand dollars now and it meant full recognition and approval this was a good start for a man who couldn't pay the king any royalty of twenty per cent because he hadn't made a penny on the way besides it was followed up by a royal annuity of twice the amount and by renewed letters patent for further voyages and discoveries in the west so cabot took good fortune at the flood and went again this time there was the full authorized flotilla of five sail of which one turned back and four sailed on somewhere on the way john cabot disappeared from history and his second son sebastian reigned in his stead sebastian like john apparently wrote nothing whatever but he talked a great deal and in after years he seems to have remembered a good many things that never happened at all nevertheless he was a very able man in several capacities and could teach a courtier or a demagogue as well as a geographer or exploiter of new claims the art of climbing over other people's backs his father's and his brother's backs included he had his troubles for king henry had pressed upon him recruits from the jails which just then were full of rebels but he had enough seamen to manage the ships and plenty of cargo for trade with the undiscovered natives sebastian perhaps left some of his three hundred men to explore newfoundland he knew they couldn't starve because as he often used to tell his gaping listeners the waters thereabouts were so thick with codfish that he had hard work to force his vessels through this first of american fish stories wildly improbable as it may seem may yet have been founded on fact when acres upon acres of the countless little caplins swim in shore to feed and they themselves are preyed on by leaping acres of voracious cod whose own rear ranks are being preyed on by hungry seals sharks herring hogs or dogfish then indeed the troubled surface of a narrowing bay is literally thick with the silvery flash of capelin the dark tumultuous backs of cod and the swirling rushes of the greater beasts of prey behind nor were certain other fish stories told by sebastian and his successors about the land of cod without some strange truths to build on cod have been caught as long as a man and weighing over a hundred pounds a whole hare a big guillemo with his beak and claws a brace of ducks so fresh that they must have been swallowed alive a rubber wading boot and a very learned treatise complete in three volumes these are a few of the curiosities actually found in sundry stomachs of the all-devouring cod the new-found cod banks were a mine of wealth for western europe at a time when every one ate fish on fast days they have remained so ever since because the enormous increase of population has kept up a constantly increasing demand for natural supplies of food basques and english spaniards french and portuguese were presently fishing for cod all round the waters of northeastern north america and were even then beginning to raise questions of national rights that have only been settled in this twentieth century after four hundred years following the coast of greenland past cape farewell sebastian cabot turned north to look for the nearest course to india and cathay the lands of silks and spices diamonds rubies pearls and gold 
john cabot had once been as far as mecca or its neighbourhood where he had seen the caravans that came across the desert of arabia from the fabled east believing the proof that the world was round he like columbus and so many more thought america was either the eastern limits of the old world or an archipelago between the extremest east and west already known thus in the early days before it was valued for itself america was commonly regarded as a mere obstruction to navigation the more solid the more exasperating now in fourteen hundred and ninety eight on his second voyage to america john cabot must have been particularly anxious to get through and show the king some better return for his money but he simply disappears and all we know is what various writers gleaned from his son sebastian later on sebastian said he coasted greenland through vast quantities of midsummer ice until he reached sixty seven degrees thirty minutes north where there was hardly any night then he turned back and probably steered a southerly course for newfoundland as he appears to have completely missed what would have seemed to him the tempting way to asia offered by hudson strait and bay passing newfoundland he stood on south as far as the virginia capes perhaps down as far as florida a few natives were caught but no real trade was done and when the explorers had reported progress to the king the general opinion was that north america was nothing to boast of after all a generation later the french sent out several expeditions to sail through north america and make discoveries by the way jacques cartier's second made in fifteen hundred and thirty five was the greatest and most successful he went up the st lawrence as high as the site of montreal the head of ocean navigation where a hundred and forty years later the local wits called la salle's seigneurie la chine in derision of his unquenchable belief in a transcontinental connection with cathay but that was under the wholly new conditions of the seventeenth century when both french and english expected to make something out of what are now the united states and canada the point of the wilting joke against la salle was a new version of the old adage go farther and fare worse the point of european opinion about america throughout the wonderful sixteenth century was that those who did go farther north than mexico were certain to fare worse and whatever the cause they generally did so there was yet a third reason why the fame of columbus eclipsed the fame of the cabots even among those english-speaking peoples whose new world home the cabots were the first to find to begin with columbus was the first of moderns to discover any spot in all america secondly while the cabots gave no writings to the world columbus did he wrote for a mighty monarch and his fame was spread abroad by what we should now call a monster publicity campaign thirdly our present point the southern lands associated with columbus and with spain yielded immense and most romantic profits during the most romantic period of the sixteenth century the northern lands connected with the cabots did nothing of the kind priority publicity and romantic wealth all favored columbus and the south then as the memory of them does to-day the four hundredth anniversary of his discovery of an island in the bahamas excited the interest of the whole world and was celebrated with great enthusiasm in the united states the four hundredth anniversary of the cabot's discovery of north america excited no interest at all outside of bristol and cape breton and a few learned societies even contemporary spain did more for the cabots than that the spanish ambassador in london carefully collected every scrap of information and sent it home to his king who turned it over as material for juan de la cosa's famous map the first dated map of america known this map made in fifteen hundred on a bullock's hide still occupies a place of honor in the naval museum at madrid and there it stands as a contemporary geographic record to show that st george's cross was the first flag ever raised over eastern north america at all events north of cape hatteras the cabots did great things though they were not great men john as we have seen already sailed out of the can of man in fourteen hundred and ninety eight during his second voyage sly sebastian lived on and almost saw elizabeth 
ascend the throne in fifteen hundred and fifty eight he had made many voyages and served many masters in the meantime in fifteen hundred and twelve he entered the service of king ferdinand of spain as a captain of the sea with a handsome salary attached six years later the emperor charles v made him chief pilot and examiner of pilots another six years and he is sitting as a nautical assessor to find out the longitude of the moluccas in order that the pope may know whether they fall within the portuguese or spanish hemisphere of exploitation presently he goes on a four years journey to south america is hindered by a mutiny explores the river plate la plata and returns in fifteen hundred and thirty about the time of the voyage to brazil of master william hawkins of which we shall hear later on in fifteen hundred and forty four sebastian made an excellent and celebrated map of the world which gives a wonderfully good idea of the coasts of north america from labrador to florida this map long given up for lost and only discovered three centuries after it had been finished is now in the national library in paris sebastian had passed his threescore years and ten before this famous map appeared but he was as active as ever twelve years later again he had left spain for england in fifteen hundred and forty eight to the rage of charles v who claimed him as a deserter which he probably was but the english boy king edward the sixth gave him a pension which was renewed by queen mary and his last ten years were spent in england where he died in the odour of sanctity as governor of the muscovy company and citizen of london whatever his faults he was a hearty good fellow with his boon companions and the following personal mention about his octogenarian revels at gravesend is well worth quoting exactly as the admiring diarist wrote it down on the twenty seventh of april fifteen hundred and fifty six when the pinnace search thrift was on the point of sailing to muscovy and the directors were giving it a great send-off after master kubota and divers gentlemen and gentlewomen had viewed our pinnace and tasted of such cheer as we could make them aboard they went on shore giving to our mariners right liberal rewards and the good old gentleman master kubota gave to the poor most liberal alms wishing them to pray for the good fortune and prosperous success of the search thrift our pinnace and then at the sign of the christopher he and his friends banqueted and made me and them that were in the company great cheer and for very joy that he had to see the towardness of our intended discovery he entered into the dance himself amongst the rest of the young and lusty company which being ended he and his friends departed most gently commending us to the governance of almighty god end of chapter one chapter two of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two henry the eighth king of the english sea the leading pioneers in the age of discovery were sons of italy spain and portugal cabot as we have seen was an italian though he sailed for the english crown and had an english crew columbus too was an italian though in the service of the spanish crown it was the portuguese vasco da gama who in the very year of john cabot's second voyage fourteen hundred and ninety eight found the great sea route to india by way of the cape of good hope two years later the corda reals also portuguese began exploring the coasts of america as far northwest as labrador twenty years later again the portuguese magellan sailing for the king of spain discovered the strait still known by his name passed through it into the pacific and reached the philippines there he was killed but one of his ships went on to make the first circumnavigation of the globe a feat which redounded to the glory of both spain and portugal meanwhile in fifteen hundred and thirteen the spaniard balboa had crossed the isthmus of panama and waded into the pacific sword in hand to claim it for the king then came the spanish explorers ponce de leon de soto coronado and many more and later on the conquerors and founders of new spain cortez pizarro and their successors 
during all this time neither france nor england made any lodgment in america though both sent out a number of expeditions both fished on the cod banks of newfoundland and each had already marked out her own sphere of influence the portuguese were in brazil the spaniards in south and central america england by right of the bristol voyages claimed the eastern coasts of the united states and canada france in virtue of cartier's discovery the region of the st lawrence but while new spain and new portugal flourished in the sixteenth century new france and new england were yet to rise in the sixteenth century both france and england were occupied with momentous things at home france was torn with religious wars tudor england had much work to do before any effective english colonies could be planted oversea dominions are nothing without sufficient sea-power naval and mercantile to win to hold and foster them but tudor england was gradually forming those naval and merchant services without which there could have been neither british empire nor united states henry the eighth had faults which have been trumpeted about the world from his own day to ours but of all english sovereigns he stands foremost as the monarch of the sea young handsome learned exceedingly accomplished gloriously strong in body and in mind and remounted the throne in fifteen hundred and nine with the hearty good will of nearly all his subjects before england could become the mother country of an empire overseas she had to shake off her mediaeval weaknesses become a strong unified modern state and arm herself against any probable combination of hostile foreign states happily for herself and for her future colonists henry was richly endowed with strength and skill for his task with one hand he welded england into political unity crushing disruptive forces by the way with the other he gradually built up a fleet the like of which the world had never seen he had the advantage of being more independent of parliamentary supplies than any other sovereign from his thrifty father he had inherited what was then an almost fabulous sum nine million dollars in cash from what his friends call the conversion and his enemies the spoliation of church property in england he obtained many millions more moreover the people as a whole always rallied to his call whenever he wanted other national resources for the national defence henry's unique distinction is that he effected the momentous change from an ancient to a modern fleet this supreme achievement constitutes his real title to the lasting gratitude of english-speaking peoples his first care when he came to the throne in fifteen hundred and nine was for the safety of the broad ditch as he called the english channel his last great act was to establish in fifteen hundred forty six the office of the admiralty and marine affairs during the thirty-seven years between his accession and the creation of this navy board the pregnant change was made king henry loved a man he had an unerring eye for choosing the right leaders he delighted in everything to do with ships and shipping he mixed freely with naval men and merchant skippers visited the dockyards promoted several improved types of vessels and always befriended fletcher of rye the shipwright who discovered the art of tacking and thereby revolutionized navigation nor was the king only a patron he invented a new type of vessel himself and thoroughly mastered scientific gunnery he was the first of national leaders to grasp the full significance of what could be done by broadsides fired from saving ships against the mediaeval type of vessel that still depended more on oars than on sails henry's maritime rivals were the two greatest monarchs of continental europe francis i of france and charles v of spain henry francis and charles were all young all ambitious and all exceedingly capable men henry had the fewest subjects charles by far the most francis had a compact kingdom well situated for a great european land power henry had one equally well situated for a great european sea power charles ruled vast dominions scattered over both the new world and the old the destinies of mankind turned mostly on the rivalry between these three protagonists and their successors charles v was heir to several crowns he ruled spain the netherlands the kingdom of the two sicilies and important principalities in northern italy 
he was elected emperor of germany he owned enormous overseas dominions in africa and the two americas soon became new spain he governed each part of his european dominions by a different title and under a different constitution he had no fixed imperial capital but moved about from place to place a legitimate sovereign everywhere and for the most part a popular one as well it was his son philip the second who failing of election as emperor lived only in spain concentrated the machinery of government in madrid and became so unpopular elsewhere charles had been brought up in flanders he was genial in the flemish way and he understood his various states in the netherlands which furnished him with one of his main sources of revenue another much larger source of revenue poured in its wealth to him later on in rapidly increasing volume from north and south america charles had inherited a long and bitter feud with france about the burgundian dominions on the french side of the rhine and about domains in italy besides which there were many points of violent rivalry between things french and spanish england also had hereditary feuds with france which had come down from the hundred years war and which had ended in her almost final expulsion from france less than a century before scotland nursing old feuds against england and always afraid of absorption naturally sided with france portugal small and open to spanish invasion by land was more or less bound to please spain during the many campaigns between francis and charles the english channel swarmed with men of war privateers and downright pirates sometimes england took a hand officially against france but even when england was not officially at war many englishmen were privateers and not a few were pirates never was there a better training school of fighting seamanship than in and around the narrow seas it was a continual struggle for an existence in which only the fittest survived quickness was essential consequently vessels that could not increase their speed were soon cleared off the sea spain suffered a good deal by this continuous raiding so did the netherlands but such was the power of charles that although his navies were much weaker than his armies he yet was able to fight by sea on two enormous fronts first in the mediterranean against the turks and other moslems secondly in the channel and along the coast all the way from antwerp to cadiz nor did the left arm of his power stop there for his fleets his transports and his merchantmen ranged the coasts of both americas from one side of the present united states right round to the other such in brief was the position of maritime europe when henry found himself menaced by the three roman catholic powers of scotland france and spain in fifteen hundred and thirty three he had divorced his first wife catherine of aragon thereby defying the pope and giving offence to spain he had again defied the pope by suppressing the monasteries and severing the church of england from the roman discipline the pope had struck back with a bull of excommunication designed to make henry the common enemy of catholic europe henry had been steadily building ships for years now he redoubled his activity he blooded the fathers of his daughter's sea-dogs by smashing up a pirate fleet and sinking a flotilla of flemish privateers the mouth of the scheldt in fifteen hundred and thirty nine was full of vessels ready to take a hostile army into england but such a fighting fleet prepared to meet them that henry's enemies forbore to strike in fifteen hundred and thirty nine too came the discovery of the art of tacking by fletcher of rye henry's shipwright friend a discovery forever memorable in the annals of seamanship never before had any kind of craft been sailed a single foot against the wind the primitive dugout on which the prehistoric savage hoisted the first semblance of a sail the ships of tarshish the roman transport in which st paul was wrecked and the spanish caravels with which columbus sailed to worlds unknown were in principle of navigation all the same but now fletcher ran out his epoch-making vessel with sails trimmed fore and aft and dumbfounded all the shipping in the channel by beating his way to windward against a good stiff breeze this achievement marked the dawn of the modern sailing age and so it happened that in fifteen hundred and forty five henry with a newborn modern fleet was able to turn defiantly on francis 
the english people rallied magnificently to his call what was at that time an enormous army covered the lines of advance on london but the fleet though employing fewer men was relatively a much more important force than the army and with the fleet went henry's own headquarters his lifelong interest in his navy now bore the first fruits of really scientific sea power on an oceanic scale there was no great naval battle to fix general attention on one dramatic moment henry's strategy and tactics however were new and full of promise he repeated his strategy of the previous war by sending out a strong squadron to attack the base at which the enemy's ships were then assembling and he definitely committed the english navy alone among all the navies in the world to sailing ship tactics instead of continuing those founded on the rowing galley of immemorial fame the change from a sort of floating army to a really naval fleet from galleys moved by oars and depending on boarders who were soldiers to ships moved by sails and depending on their broadside guns this change was quite as important as the change in the nineteenth century from sails and smooth boards to steam and rifled ordnance it was indeed from at least one commanding point of view much more important for it meant that england was easily first in developing the only kind of navy which would count in any struggle for over sea dominion after the discovery of america had made sea power no longer a question of coasts and landlocked waters but of all the outer oceans of the world the year that saw the birth of modern sea power is a date to be remembered in this history for fifteen hundred and forty five was also the year in which the mines of potosi first aroused the old world to the riches of the new it was the year too in which sir francis drake was born moreover there was another significant birth in this same year the parole aboard the portsmouth fleet was god save the king the answering countersign was long to reign over us these words formed the nucleus of the national anthem now sung round all the seven seas the anthems of other countries were born on land god save the king sprang from the navy and the sea the reformation quickened sea-faring life in many ways after henry's excommunication every roman catholic crew had full papal sanction for attacking every english crew that would not submit to rome no matter how catholic its faith might be thus in addition to danger from pirates privateers and men of war an english merchantman had to risk attack by any one who was either passionately roman or determined to use religion as a cloak raids and reprisals grew apace the english were by no means always lambs in piteous contrast to the papal wolves rather it might be said they took a motto from this true russian proverb make yourself a sheep and you'll find no lack of wolves but rightly or wrongly the general english view was that the papal attitude was one of attack while their own was one of defence papal europe of course thought quite the reverse henry died in fifteen hundred and forty seven and the lord protector somerset at once tried to make england as protestant as possible during the minority of edward the sixth who was not yet ten years old this brought every english seaman under suspicion in every spanish port where the holy office of the inquisition was a great deal more vigilant and business-like than the custom-house or harbour master inquisitors had seized englishmen in henry's time but charles had stayed their hand now that the ruler of england was an open heretic who appeared to reject the accepted forms of catholic belief as well as the papal forms of roman discipline the hour had come to strike war would have followed in ordinary times but the reformation had produced a cross division among the subjects of all the great powers if charles went to war with a protestant lord protector of england then some of his own subjects in the netherlands would probably revolt france had her huguenots england her ultra papists scotland some of both kinds every country had an unknown number of enemies at home and friends abroad all feared war somerset neglected the navy but the seafaring men among the protestants as among those catholics who were anti-roman took to privateering more than ever nor was exploration forgotten a group of merchant adventurers sent sir hugh willoughby to find the northeast passage to cathay 
Willoughby's three ships were towed down the Thames by oarsmen dressed in sky-blue jackets. As they passed the palace at Greenwich, they dipped their colours in salute, but the poor young king was too weak to come to the window. Willoughby met his death in Lapland, but Chancellor, his second-in-command, got through to the White Sea, pushed on overland to Moscow, and returned safe in 1554, when Queen Mary was on the throne next year strange to say the charter of the new muscovy company was granted by philip of armada fame now joint sovereign of england with his newly married wife soon to be known as bloody mary one of the directors of the company was lord howard of effingham father of drake's lord admiral while the governor was our old friend sebastian cabot now in his eightieth year philip was crown prince of the spanish empire and his father charles v was very anxious that he should please the stubborn english for if he could only become both king of england and emperor of germany he would rule the world by sea as well as land philip did his ineffective best drank english beer in public as if he liked it and made his stately spanish courtiers drink it too and smile he spent spanish gold brought over from america and he got the convenient kind of englishmen to take it as spy money for many years to come but with it he likewise sowed some dragon's teeth the english sea-dogs never forgot the iron chests of spanish new world gold and presently began to wonder whether there was no sure way in far america by which to get it for themselves in the same year fifteen hundred and fifty five the marian attack on english heretics began and the sea became safer than the land for those who held strong anti-papal views the royal navy was neglected even more than it had been lately by the lord protector but fighting traitors privateers and pirates multiplied the seaports were hotbeds of hatred against mary philip papal rome and spanish inquisition in fifteen hundred and fifty six sebastian cabot reappears genial and prosperous as ever and dances out of history at the sailing of the search thrift bound northeast for muscovy in fifteen hundred and fifty seven philip came back to england for the last time and manoeuvred her into a war which cost her calais the last english foothold on the soil of france during this war an english squadron joined philip's vessels in a victory over the french off gravelines where drake was to fight the armada thirty years later this first of the two battles fought at gravelines brings us down to fifteen hundred and fifty eight the year in which mary died elizabeth succeeded her and a very different english age began end of chapter two Chapter Three of Elizabethan Sea Dogs by William Wood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: Life Afloat in Tudor Times. Two stories from Hacklett's Voyages will illustrate what sort of work the English were attempting in America about fifteen hundred and thirty, near the middle of King Henry's reign the success of master hawkins and the failure of master hoare are quite typical of several other adventures in the new world old mr william hawkins of plymouth a man for his wisdom valor experience and skill in sea causes much esteemed and beloved of king henry the eighth and being one of the principal sea captains in the west parts of england in his time not contented with the short voyages commonly then made only to the known coasts of europe armed out a tall and goodly ship of his own of the burthen of two hundred and fifty tons called the pole of plymouth wherewith he made three long and famous voyages unto the coast of brazil a thing in those days very rare especially to our nation hawkins first went down the guinea coast of africa where he trafficked with the negroes and took of them oliphants teeth and other commodities which that place yieldeth and so arriving on the coast of brazil used there such discretion and behaved himself so wisely with those savage people that he grew into great familiarity and friendship with them 
insomuch that in his second voyage one of the savage kings of the country of brazil was contented to take ship with him and to be transported hither into england this king was presented unto king henry the eighth the king and all the nobility did not a little marvel for in his cheeks were holes and therein small bones planted which in his country was reputed for a great bravery the poor brazilian monarch died on his voyage back which made hawkins fear for the life of martin cockerham whom he had left in brazil as a hostage however the brazilians took hawkins's word for it and released cockerham who lived another forty years in plymouth old mr william hawkins was the father of sir john hawkins drake's companion in arms whom we shall meet later he was also the grandfather of sir richard hawkins another naval hero and of the second william hawkins one of the founders of the greatest of all chartered companies the honourable east india company hawkins knew what he was about master hoar did not hoar was a well-meaning plausible fellow good at taking up new-fangled ideas bad at carrying them out and the very cut of a wildcat company promoter except for his honesty he persuaded divers young lawyers of the inns of court and chancery to go to newfoundland a hundred and twenty men set off in this modern ship of fools which ran into newfoundland at night and was wrecked there were no provisions and none of the divers lawyers seems to have known how to catch a fish after trying to live on wild fruit they took to eating each other in spite of master hoar who stood up boldly and warned them of the fire to come just then a french fishing smack came in whereupon the lawyers seized her put her wretched crew ashore and sailed away with all the food she had the outraged frenchman found another vessel chased the lawyers back to england and laid their case before the king who out of his royal bounty reimbursed the frenchman and let the divers lawyers go scot-free hawkins and hoar and others like them were the heroes of travellers tales but what was the ordinary life of the sailor who went down to the sea in the ships of the tudor age there are very few quite authentic descriptions of life afloat before the end of the sixteenth century and even then we rarely see the ship and crew about their ordinary work everybody was all agog for marvellous discoveries nobody least of all a seaman bothered his head about describing the daily routine on board we know however that it was a lot of almost incredible hardship only the fittest could survive elizabethan landsmen may have been quite as prone to mistake comfort for civilization as most of the world is said to be now elizabethan sailors when afloat most certainly were not and for the simple reason that there was no such thing as real comfort in a ship here are a few verses from the oldest genuine english sea-song known they were written down in the fifteenth century before the discovery of america and were probably touched up a little by the scribe the original manuscript is now in trinity college cambridge it is a true nautical composition a very rare thing indeed for genuine sea-songs didn't often get into print and weren't enjoyed by landsmen when they did the setting is that of a merchantman carrying passengers whose discomforts rather amuse the shipmen anon the master commandeth fast to his shipmen in all the hasta to dress them line up soon about the mast their takling to make with how hissa then they cry what how mate thou standest too nigh thy fellow may not haul thee by thus they begin to crake shout a boy or twain anon upstain go aloft and over thwart the sail yard lane lie ye how talia the remnant cryin cry and pull with all their might bestow the boat boatswain anon that our pilgrims may play thereon for some are like to cough and groan ere it be full midnight 
haul the bowline now veer the sheet cook may ready anon our meat our pilgrims have no lust to eat i pray god give them rest go to the helm what ho no nearer steward fellow a pot of beer ye shall have sir with good cheer anon all of the best ye how trussa haul in the brails thou haulest not by god thou failsest o oh, see how well our good ship sails and thus they say among this meanwhile the pilgrims lie and have their bowls all fast them by and cry after hot malvasi their health for to restore some lay their books on their knee and read so long they cannot see alas mine head will split in three thus saith one poor wight a sack of straw were there right good for some must lay them in their hood i had as lief be in the wood without or meat or drink for when that we shall go to bed the pump is nigh our bed is head a man he were as good be dead as smell there of the stink how hissa is still used aboard deep water men as ho hissa instead of ho hoist away what ho mate is also known afloat though dying out ye how talia is yo yo tally or tally and belay which means hauling aft and making fast the sheet of a mainsail or foresail what ho no nearer is what ho no higher now but old salts remember no nearer and it may be still extant sea-sickness seems to have been the same as ever so was the desperate effort to pretend one was not really feeling it and cry after hot malvasy their health for to restore here is another sea song one sung by the sea dogs themselves the doubt is whether the martial men are navy men as distinguished from merchant service men aboard a king's ship or whether they are soldiers who want to take all sailors down a peg or two this seems the more probable explanation soldiers ranked sailors afloat in the sixteenth century and drake's was the first fleet in the world in which seamen admirals were allowed to fight a purely naval action we be three poor mariners newly come from the seas we spend our lives in jeopardy while others live at ease we care not for those martial men that do our states disdain but we care for those merchantmen that do our states maintain a third old sea song gives voice to the universal complaint that landsmen cheat sailors who come home flush of gold for sailors they be honest men and they do take great pains but landmen and ruffling lads do rob them of their gains here too is some cordial advice against the wiles of the sea addressed to all rash young men who think to advance their decaying fortunes by navigation as most of the sea-dogs and gentlemen adventurers like gilbert raleigh and cavendish tried to do you merchant men of billingsgate i wonder how you thrive you bargain with men for six months and pay them but for five this was an abuse that took a long time to die out even well on in the nineteenth century and sometimes even on board of steamers victualling was only by the lunar month though service went by the calendar a cursed cat with thrice three tails doth much increase our woe is a poetical way of putting another's seaman's grievance people who regret that there is such a discrepancy between genuine sea-songs and shore-going imitations will be glad to know that the mermaid is genuine though the usual air to which it was sung afloat was harsh and decidedly inferior to the one used ashore this example of the old four bitters so-called because sung from the four bits a convenient mass of stout timbers near the foremast did not luxuriate in the repetitions of its shore-going rival with a comb and a glass in her hand her hand her hand etc solo on friday morn as we set sail it was not far from land oh there i spied a fair pretty maid with a comb and a glass in her hand chorus the stormy winds did blow and the raging seas did roar while we poor sailors went to the tops and the landlubbers laid below 
the anonymous author of a curious composition entitled the complaint of scotland written in fifteen hundred and forty eight seems to be the only man who took more interest in the means than in the ends of seamanship he was undoubtedly a landsman but he loved the things of the sea and his work is well worth reading as a vocabulary of the lingo that was used on board a tudor ship when the seamen sang it sounded like an echo in a cave many of the outlandish words were mediterranean terms which the scientific italian navigators had brought north others were of oriental origin which was very natural in view of the long connection between east and west at sea admiral for instance comes from the arabic for a commander-in-chief amir al bar means commander of the sea most of the nautical technicalities would strike a seaman of the present day as being quite modern the sixteenth-century skipper would be readily understood by a twentieth-century helmsman in the case of such orders as these keep full and by luff connor steady keep close our modern sailor in the navy however would be hopelessly lost in trying to follow directions like the following make ready your cannons middle culverins bastard culverins falcons sakers slings headsticks murderers passivolants bazils dogs crook arquebuses calivers and hail shot another look at life afloat in the sixteenth century brings us once more into touch with america for the old sea-dog directions for the taking of a prize were admirably summed up in the seaman's grammar which was compiled by captain john smith sometime governor of virginia and admiral of new england pocahontas smith in fact a sail how bears she to windward or leeward set him by the compass he stands right ahead or on the weather bow or lee bow let fly your colours if you have a consort else not out with all your sails a steady man at the helm give him chase he holds his own no we gather on him captain out goes his flag and pendants also his waist cloths and top armings which is a long red cloth that goeth round about the ship on the outsides of all her upper works and fore and main tops as well for the countenance and grace of the ship as to cover the men from being seen he furls and slings his main yard in goes his sprit sail thus they strip themselves into their fighting sails which his only the foresail the main and fore top sails because the rest should not be fired nor spoiled besides they would be troublesome to handle hinder our sights and the using of our arms he makes ready his close fights fore and aft bulkheads set up to cover men under fire every man to his charge douse your topsail to salute him for the sea hail him with a noise of trumpets whence is your ship of spain whence is yours of england are you merchants or men of war we are of the sea he waves us to leeward with his drawn sword calls out amain for the king of spain and springs his luff brings his vessel close by the wind give him a chase piece with your broadside and run a good berth ahead of him done done we have the wind of him and now he tacks about tack about also and keep your luff be yer at the helm edge in with him give him a volley of small shot also your prow and broadside as before and keep your luff he pays us shot for shot well we shall requite him edge in with him again begin with your bow pieces proceed with your broadside and let her fall off with the wind to give him also your full chase your weather broadside and bring her round so that the stern may also discharge and your tacks close aboard again the wind veers the sea goes too high to board her and we are shot through and through and between wind and water try the pump bear up the helm sling a man overboard to stop the leaks that is truss him up around the middle in a piece of canvas and a rope with his arms at liberty with a mallet and plugs lapped in oakum and well tarred and a tarpaulin clout which he will quickly beat into the holes the bullets made what cheer mates is all well all's well then make ready to bear up with him again with all your great and small shot charge him board him thwart the hawse on the bow midships or rather than fail on his quarter or make fast your grapplings to his close fights and sheer off which would tear his cover down captain we are foul of each other and the ship is on fire cut anything to get clear and smother the fire with wet cloths 
in such a case they will be presently such friends as to help one the other all they can to get clear lest they should both burn together and so sink and if they be generous and the fire be quenched they will drink kindly one to the other heave their cans overboard and begin again as before chirurgeon look to the wounded and wind up the slain and give them three guns for their funerals swabber make clean the ship purser record their names watch be vigilant to keep your berth to windward that we lose him not in the night gunners sponge your ordnance soldiers scour your pieces carpenters about your leaks boatswain and the rest repair sails and shrouds cook see you observe your directions against the morning watch boy hello is the kettle boiled ay ay sir boatswain call up the men to prayer and breakfast always have as much care to their wounded as to your own and if there be either young women or aged men use them nobly sound drums and trumpets st george for merry england end of chapter three yeah. chapter four of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four elizabethan england elizabethan england is the motherland the true historic home of all the different peoples who speak the sea-born english tongue in the reign of elizabeth there was only one english-speaking nation this nation consisted of a bare five million people fewer than there are to-day in london or new york but hardly had the great queen died before englishmen began that colonizing movement which has carried their language the whole world round and established their civilization in every quarter of the globe within three centuries after elizabeth's day the use of english as a native speech had grown quite thirtyfold within the same three centuries the number of those living under laws and institutions derived from england had grown a hundredfold the england of elizabeth was an england of great deeds but of greater dreams elizabethan literature take it for all in all has never been surpassed myriad-minded shakespeare remains unequalled still elizabethan england was indeed a nest of singing birds prose was often far too pedestrian for the exultant life of such a mighty generation as new worlds came into their expectant ken the glowing elizabethans wished to fly there on the soaring wings of verse to them the tide of fortune was no ordinary stream but the white-maned proud neck-arching tide that bore adventures to sea with pomp of waters unwithstood the goodly heritage that england gave her offspring overseas included shakespeare and the english bible the authorized version entered into the very substance of early american life there was a marked difference between episcopalian virginia and puritan new england but both took their stand on this version of the english bible in which the springs of holy writ rejoiced to run through channels of elizabethan prose it is true that elizabeth slept with her fathers before this book of books was printed and that the first of the stuarts reigned in her stead nevertheless the authorized version is pure elizabethan all its translators were elizabethans as their dedication to king james still printed with every copy gratefully acknowledges in its reference to the setting of that bright occidental star queen elizabeth of most happy memory these words of the reverend scholars contain no empty compliment elizabeth was a great sovereign and in some essential particulars a very great national leader this daughter of henry the eighth and his second wife anne boleyn the debonair was born a heretic in fifteen hundred and thirty three her father was then defying both spain and the pope within three years after her birth her mother was beheaded and by act of parliament elizabeth herself was declared illegitimate she was fourteen when her father died leaving the kingdom to his three children in succession elizabeth being the third 
then followed the protestant reign of the boy king edward the sixth during which elizabeth enjoyed security then the catholic reign of her spanish half-sister bloody mary during which her life hung by the merest thread at first however mary concealed her hostility to elizabeth because she thought the two daughters of henry the eighth ought to appear together in her triumphal entry into london from one point of view and a feminine one at that this was a fatal mistake on mary's part for never did elizabeth show to more advantage she was just under twenty while mary was nearly twice her age mary had indeed provided herself with one good foil in the person of anne of cleves the flemish mare whose flat coarse face and lumbering body had disgusted king henry thirteen years before when cromwell had foisted her upon him as his fourth wife but with poor fat straw-coloured anne on one side and black and sallow foreign-looking man-voiced mary on the other the thoroughly english princess elizabeth took london by storm on the spot tall and majestic she was a magnificent example of the finest anglo-norman type always the glass of fashion and then the very mould of form her splendid figure looked equally well on horseback or on foot a little full in the eye and with a slightly aquiline nose she appeared as she really was keenly observant and commanding though these two features just prevented her from being a beauty the bright blue eyes and the finely chiselled nose were themselves quite beautiful enough nor was she less taking to the ear than to the eye for in marked contrast to gruff foreign mary and wheezy foreign anne she had a rich clear though rather too loud english voice when the court reined up and dismounted elizabeth became even more the centre of attraction mary marched stiffly on and plodded after but as for elizabeth perfect in dancing riding archery and all the sports of chivalry she trod the line like a buck in spring and looked like a lance in rest when elizabeth succeeded mary in the autumn of fifteen hundred and fifty eight she had dire need of all she had learnt in her twenty-five years of adventurous life fortunately for herself and on the whole most fortunately for both england and america she had a remarkable power of inspiring devotion to the service of their queen and country in men of both the cool and ardent types and this long after her personal charms had gone government religion finance defence and foreign affairs were in a perilous state of flux besides which they have never been more distractingly mixed up with one another henry the seventh had saved money for twenty-five years his three successors had spent it lavishly for fifty henry the eighth had kept the church catholic in ritual while making it purely national in government the lord protector somerset had made it as protestant as possible under edward the sixth mary had done her best to bring it back to the pope home affairs were full of doubts and dangers though the great mass of the people were ready to give their handsome young queen a fair chance and not a little favour foreign affairs were worse france was still the hereditary enemy and the loss of calais under mary had exasperated the whole english nation scotland was a constant menace in the north spain was gradually changing from friend to foe the pope was disinclined to recognize elizabeth at all to understand how difficult her position was we must remember what sort of constitution england had when the germ of the united states was forming the roman empire was one constituent whole from the emperor down the english-speaking peoples of to-day form constituent wholes from the electorate up in both cases all parts were and are in constant relation to the whole the case of elizabeth in england however was very different there was neither despotic unity from above nor democratic unity from below but a mixed and fluctuating kind of government in which crown nobles parliament and people formed certain parts which had to be put together for each occasion the accepted general idea was that the sovereign supreme as an individual looked after the welfare of the country in peace and war so far as the crown estates permitted but that whenever the crown resources would not suffice then the sovereign could call on nobles and people for whatever the common weal required noblesse oblige 
in return for the estates or monopolies which they had acquired the nobles and favoured commoners were expected to come forward with all their resources at every national crisis precisely as the crown was expected to work for the commonweal at all times when the resources of the crown and favoured courtiers sufficed no parliament was called but whenever they had to be supplemented then parliament met and voted whatever it approved finally every english freeman was required to do his own share towards defending the country in time of need and he was further required to know the proper use of arms the great object of every european court during early modern times was to get both the old feudal nobility and the newly promoted commoners to revolve round the throne as round the centre of their solar system by sheer force of character for the tudors had no overwhelming army like the roman conquerors henry the eighth had succeeded wonderfully well elizabeth now had to piece together what had been broken under edward the sixth and mary she too succeeded and with the hearty good will of nearly all her subjects mary had left the royal treasury deeply in debt yet elizabeth succeeded in paying off all arrears and meeting new expenditure for defence and for the court the royal income rose england became immensely richer and more prosperous than ever before foreign trade increased by leaps and bounds home industries flourished and were stimulated by new arrivals from abroad because england was a safe asylum for the craftsmen whom philip was driving from the netherlands to his own great loss and his rival's gain english commercial life had been slowly emerging from mediaeval ways throughout the fifteenth century with the beginning of the sixteenth the rate of emergence had greatly quickened the soil-bound peasant who produced enough food for his family from his thirty acres was being gradually replaced by the well-to-do yeoman who tilled a hundred acres and upwards such holdings produced a substantial surplus for the market this increased the national wealth which in its turn increased both home and foreign trade the peasant merely raised a little wheat and barley kept a cow and perhaps some sheep the yeoman or tenant farmer had sheep enough for the wool trade besides some butter cheese and meat for the nearest growing town he began to garnish his cupboards with pewter and his joined beds with tapestry and silk hangings and his tables with carpets and fine napery he could even feast his neighbours and servants after shearing day with new-fangled foreign luxuries like dates mace raisins currants and sugar but elizabethan society presented striking contrasts in parts of england the practice of engrossing and enclosing holdings was increasing as sheep raising became more profitable than farming the tenants thus dispossessed either swelled the ranks of the vagabonds who infested the highways or sought their livelihood at sea or in london which provided the two best openings for adventurous young men the smaller provincial towns afforded them little opportunity for there the trades were largely in the hands of close corporations descended from the mediaeval craft guilds these were eventually to be swept away by the general trend of business their dissolution had indeed already begun for smart village craftsmen were even then forming the new industrial settlements from which most of the great manufacturing towns of england have sprung camden the historian found birmingham full of ringing anvils sheffield a town of great name for the smiths therein leeds renowned for cloth and manchester already a sort of cottonopolis though the cottons of those days were still made of wool there was a wages question then as now there were demands for a minimum living wage the influx of gold and silver from america had sent all prices soaring meat became almost prohibitive for the submerged tenth there was a rapidly submerging tenth beef rose from one cent a pound in the forties to four in fifteen hundred and eighty eight the year of the armada how would the lowest paid of craftsmen fare on twelve cents a day with butter at ten cents a pound efforts were made again and again to readjust the ratio between prices and wages but as a rule prices increased much faster than wages 
all these things the increase of surplus hands the high cost of living grievances about wages and interest tended to make the farms and workshops of england recruiting grounds for the sea and the young men would strike out for themselves as freighters traders privateers or downright pirates lured by the dazzling chance of great and sudden wealth the gamble of it was as potent then as now probably more potent still it was an age of wild speculation accompanied by all the usual evils that follow frenzied ways it was also an age of monopoly both monopoly and speculation sent recruits into the sea-dog ranks elizabeth would grant say to sir walter raleigh the monopoly of sweet wines raleigh would naturally want as much sweet wine imported as england could be induced to swallow so too would elizabeth who got the duty crews would be wanted for the monopolistic ships they would also be wanted for free trading vessels that is for the ships of the smugglers who underbid undersold and tried to overreach the monopolist who represented law though not quite justice but speculation ran to greater extremes than either monopoly or smuggling shakespeare's putter out of five for one was a typical elizabethan speculator exploiting the riskiest form of sea-dog trade for all and sometimes for more than all that it was worth a merchant adventurer would pay a capitalist say a thousand pounds as a premium to be forfeited if his ship should be lost but to be repaid by the capitalist fivefold to the merchant if it returned incredible as it may seem to us there were shrewd money-lenders always ready for this sort of deal in life or life and death insurance an eloquent testimony to the risks encountered in sailing unknown seas in the midst of well-known dangers marine insurance of the regular kind was of course a very different thing it was already of immemorial age going back certainly to mediaeval and probably to very ancient times all forms of insurance on land are mere mushrooms by comparison lloyd's had not been heard of but there were plenty of smart elizabethan underwriters already practising the general principles which were to be formally adopted two hundred years later in seventeen hundred and seventy nine at lloyd's coffee-house a policy taken out on the tiger immortalized by shakespeare would serve as a model still and what makes it all the more interesting is that the elizabethan underwriters calculated the tiger's chances at the very spot where the association known as lloyd's transacts its business to-day the royal exchange in london this in turn brings elizabeth herself upon the scene for when she visited the exchange which sir thomas gresham had built to let the merchants do their street work under cover she immediately grasped its full significance and caused it by an herald and a trumpet to be proclaimed the royal exchange the name it bears to-day an elizabethan might well be astonished by what he would see at any modern lloyd's yet he would find the same essentials for the british lloyd's like most of its foreign imitators is not a gigantic insurance company at all but an association of cautiously elected members who carry on their completely independent private business in daily touch with each other precisely as elizabethans did lloyd's method differs wholly from ordinary insurance instead of insuring vessel and cargo with a single company or man the owner puts his case before lloyd's and any member can then write his name underneath for any reasonable part of the risk the modern underwriter all the world over is the direct descendant of the elizabethan who wrote his name under the conditions of a given risk at sea joint stock companies were in one sense old when elizabethan men of business were young but the elizabethans developed them enormously 
going shares was doubtless prehistoric it certainly was ancient mediaeval and elizabethan but those who formerly went shares generally knew each other and something of the business too the favourite number of total shares was just sixteen there were sixteen land shares in a celtic household sixteen shares in scottish vessels not individually owned sixteen shares in the theatre by which shakespeare made his pile but sixteenths and even hundredths were put out of date when speculation on the grander scale began and the area of investment grew the new river company for supplying london with water had only a few shares then as it continued to have down to our own day when they stood at over a thousand times par the ulster plantation in ireland was more remote and appealed to more investors and on wider grounds sentimental grounds both good and bad included the virginia plantation was still more remote and risky and appealed to an ever-increasing number of the speculating public many an investor put money on america in much the same way as a factory hand to-day puts money on a horse he has never seen or has never heard of otherwise than as something out of which a lot of easy money can be made provided luck holds good the modern prospectus was also in full career under elizabeth who probably had a hand in concocting some of the most important specimens lord bacon wrote one describing the advantages of the newfoundland fisheries in terms which no promoter of the present day could better every type of prospectus was tried on the investing public some genuine many doubtful others as outrageous in their impositions on human credulity as anything produced in our own times the company promoter was abroad in london on change and at court what with royal favour social prestige general prosperity the new national eagerness to find vent for surplus commodities and above all the spirit of speculation fanned into flame by the real and fabled wonders of america what with all this the investing public could take its choice of going the limit in a hundred different and most alluring ways england was surprised at her own investing wealth the east india company raised eight million dollars with ease from a thousand shareholders and paid a first dividend of eighty seven and a half per cent spices pearls and silks came pouring into london and english goods found vent increasingly abroad vastly expanding business opportunities of course produced the spirit of the trust and a very much the same sort of trust that americans think so ultra-modern now monopolies granted by the crown and the volcanic forces of widespread speculation prevented some of the abuses of the trust but there were elizabethan trusts for all that though many a promising scheme fell through the felt makers hat trust is a case in point they proposed buying up all the hats in the market so as to oblige all dealers to depend upon one central warehouse of course they issued a prospectus showing how every one concerned would benefit by this benevolent plan ben jonson and other playwrights were quick to seize the salient absurdities of such an advertisement in the staple of news jonson proposed a news trust to collect all the news of the world corner it classify it into authentic apocryphal barbarous gossip and so forth and then sell it for the sole benefit of the consumer in links to suit all purchasers in the devil is an ass he is a little more outspoken we'll take in citizens commoners and aldermen to bear the charge and blow them off again like so many dead flies this was exactly what was at that very moment being done in the case of the alum trust all the leading characters of much more modern times were there already fitz dottrell ready to sell his estates in order to become his grace the duke of drowned land gilt head the london money-lender who lives by finding fools and my lady tailbush who pulls the social wires at court and so the game went on usually with the result explained by shakespeare's fisherman in pericles i marvel how the fishes live in the sea why as men do a land the great ones eat up the little ones 
the newcastle coal trade grew into something very like a modern american trust with the additional advantage of an authorized government monopoly so long as the agreed-upon duty was paid then there was the starch monopoly a very profitable one because starch was a new delight which soon enabled elizabethan fops to wear ruffled collars big enough to make their heads as one irreverent satirist exclaimed look like john baptists on a platter but america could not america defeat the machinations of all monopolies and other trusts wasn't america the land of actual gold and silver where there was plenty of room for every one there soon grew up a wild belief that you could tap america for precious metals almost as its indians tapped maple trees for sugar the mountains of bright stones were surely there peru and mexico were nothing to these only find them and get rich quick would be the order of the day for every true adventurer these mountains moved about in men's imaginations and on prospectors maps always ahead of the latest pioneer somewhere behind the back of beyond they in their glamour died hard even that staid geographer of a later day thomas jeffreys added to his standard atlas of america in seventeen hundred and sixty this item of information on the far northwest hereabouts are supposed to be the mountains of bright stones mentioned in the map of ye indian Akagak speculation of the wildcat kind was bad but it was the seamy side of a praiseworthy spirit of enterprise monopoly seems worse than speculation and so in many ways it was but we must judge it by the custom of its age it was often unjust and generally obstructive but it did what neither the national government nor joint stock companies had yet learnt to do monopoly went by court favour and its rights were often scandalously let and sometimes sublet as well but on the whole the queen the court and the country really meant business and monopolists had either to deliver the goods or get out monopolists sold dispensations from unworkable laws which was sometimes a good thing and sometimes a bad they sold licenses for indulgence in forbidden pleasures not often harmless they thawed out and collected all kinds of indirect taxation and had to face all the troubles that confront the framers of a tariff policy to-day most of all however in a rough and ready way they set a sort of civil service going they served as boards of trade departments of the interior customs inland revenue and so forth what crown and parliament either could not or would not do was farmed out to monopolists like speculation the system worked both ways and frequently for evil but like the british constitution though on a lower plane it worked a monopoly at home like those which we have been considering was endurable because it was a working compromise that suited existing circumstances more or less and that could be either mended or ended as time went on but a general foreign monopoly like spain's monopoly of america was quite unendurable could spain not only hold what she had discovered and was exploiting but also extend her sphere of influence over what she had not discovered spain said yes england said no the spaniards looked for tribute the english looked for trade in government in religion in business in everything the two great rivals were irreconcilably opposed thus the lists were set and sea-dog battles followed elizabeth was an exceedingly able woman of business and was practically president of all the great joint stock companies engaged in oversea trade wherever a cargo could be bought or sold there went an english ship to buy or sell it whenever the authorities in foreign parts tried discrimination against englishmen or english goods the english sea-dogs growled and showed their teeth and if the foreigners persisted the sea-dogs bit them elizabeth was extravagant at court but not without state motives for at least a part of her extravagance a brilliant court attracted the upper classes into the orbit of the crown while it impressed the whole country with the sovereign's power courtiers favoured with monopolies had to spend their earnings when the state was threatened and might not the queen's vast profusion of jewellery be turned to account at a pinch elizabeth could not afford to be generous when she was young she grew to be stingy when she was old 
but she saved the state by sound finance as well as by arms in spite of all her pomps and vanity she had three thousand dresses and gorgeous ones at that during the course of her reign her bathroom was wainscotted with venetian mirrors so that she could see nine and ninety reflections of her very comely person as she dipped and splashed or dried her royal skin she set a hot pace for all the votaries of dress to follow all kinds of fashion came in from abroad with the rush of new-found wealth and so instead of being sanely beautiful they soon became insanely bizarre an englishman says harrison endeavouring to write of our attire gave over his travail and only drew the picture of a naked man since he could find no kind of garment that could please him any whiles together i am an englishman and naked i stand here musing in my mind what raiment i shall wear for now i will wear this and now i will wear that and now i will wear i cannot tell what except you see a dog in a doublet you shall not see any so disguised as are my countrymen of england women also do far exceed the likeness of our men what shall i say of their gala gascon to bear out their attire and make it fit plumb round but the wives of citizens and burgesses like all nouveau riche were still more bizarre than the courtiers they cannot tell when or how to make an end being women in whom all kind of curiosity is to be seen in far greater measure than in women of higher calling i might name hues devised for the nonce verdoy twixt green and yellow peas porridge tawny pop and jay blue and the devil in the head yet all this crude absurdity from the courtier to the carter was the glass reflecting the constantly increasing seaborne trade ever pushing farther afield under the stimulus and protection of the sea-dogs and the queen took precious good care that it all paid toll to her treasury through the customs so that she could have more money to build more ships and if her courtiers did stuff their breeches out with sawdust she took equally good care that each fighting man among them donned his uniform and raised his troops or fitted out his ships when the time was ripe for action End of chapter four chapter five of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Hawkins and the Fighting Traders Said Francis I of France to Charles V, King of Spain, Your Majesty and the King of Portugal have divided the world between you, offering no part of it to me. Show me, I pray you, the will of our father Adam, so that I may see if he has really made you his only universal heirs then francis sent out the italian navigator verrazzano who first explored the coast from florida to newfoundland afterwards jacques cartier discovered the st lawrence frenchmen took havana twice plundered the spanish treasure ships and tried to found colonies catholic in canada protestant in florida and brazil thus at the time when elizabeth ascended the throne of england in fifteen hundred and fifty eight there was a long-established new spain extending over mexico the west indies and most of south america a small new portugal confined to part of brazil and a shadowy new france running vaguely inland from the gulf of st lawrence nowhere effectively occupied and mostly overlapping prior english claims based on the discoveries of the cabots england and france had often been enemies england and spain had just been allied in a war against france as well as by the marriage of philip and mary william hawkins had traded with portuguese brazil under henry the eighth as the southampton merchants were to do later on english merchants lived in lisbon and cadiz a few were even settled in new spain and a friendly spaniard had been so delighted by the prospective union of the english with the spanish crown that he had given the name of londra london to a new settlement in the argentine andes 
Presently, however, Elizabethan England began to part company with Spain, to become more anti-papal, to sympathize with Huguenots and other heretics, and like Francis I, to wonder why an immense new world should be nothing but new Spain. Besides, Englishmen knew what the rest of Europe knew, that the discovery of Potosi had put out of business nearly all the old world silver mines, and that the Burgundian ass, as Spanish treasure mules were called, from Charles's love of Burgundy, had enabled Spain to make conquests, impose her will on her neighbors, and keep paid spies in every foreign court, the English court included. Londoners had seen Spanish gold and silver paraded through the streets when Philip married Mary, twenty-seven chests of bullion, ninety-nine horse loads, plus two cartloads of gold and silver coin, and ninety-seven boxes full of silver bars. Moreover, the Holy Inquisition was making Spanish seaports pretty hot for heretics. In 1562, twenty-six English subjects were burnt alive in Spain itself. Ten times as many were in prison. No wonder sea dogs were straining at the leash. Neither Philip nor Elizabeth wanted war just then, though each enjoyed a thrust at the other by any kind of fighting short of that, and though each winked at all kinds of armed trade, such as privateering and even downright piracy. The English and Spanish merchants had commercial connections going back for centuries, and Businessmen on both sides were always ready to do a good stroke for themselves. This was the state of affairs in 1562 when young John Hawkins, son of old Master William, went into the slave trade with New Spain. Except for the fact that both Portugal and Spain allowed no trade with their oversea possessions in any ships but their own, the circumstances appeared to favor his enterprise. The American Indians were withering away before the atrocious cruelties of the Portuguese and Spaniards being either killed in battle, used up in merciless slavery, or driven off to alien wilds. Already the Portuguese had commenced to import Negroes from their West African possessions, both for themselves and for trade with the Spaniards who had none. Brazil prospered beyond expectation and absorbed all the blacks that Portuguese shipping could supply. The Spaniards had no spare tonnage at the time. John Hawkins, aged thirty, had made several trips to the Canaries. He now formed a joint stock company to trade with the Spaniards farther off. Two Lord Mayors of London and the Treasurer of the Royal Navy were among the subscribers. Three small vessels with only 260 tons between them formed the flotilla. The crews numbered just a hundred men. At Tenerife, he received friendly treatment. From thence he passed to Sierra Leona, where he stayed a good time, and got into his possession, partly by the sword and partly by other means, to the number of 300 negroes, at the least, besides other merchandises. With this prey he sailed over the ocean sea unto the island of Hispaniola, Haiti, and here he had reasonable utterance sale of his English commodities, as also of some part of his negroes, trusting the Spaniards no further than that by his own strength he was able still to master them. At Monte Cristi, another port on the north side of Hispaniola, he made vent of sold, the whole number of his negroes for which he received by way of exchange such a quantity of merchandise that he did not only laid his own three ships with hides ginger sugars and some quantity of pearls but he freighted also to other hulks with hides and other like commodities which he sent into spain where both hulks and hides were confiscated as being contraband Nothing daunted, he was off again in 1564 with four ships and 170 men. This time Elizabeth herself took shares and lent the Jesus of Lubeck a vessel of 700 tons which Henry VIII had bought for the navy. Nobody questioned slavery in those days. The great Spanish missionary Las Casas denounced the Spanish atrocities against the Indians, but he thought Negroes who could be domesticated would do as substitutes for Indians who could not be domesticated. 
the indians withered at the white man's touch the negroes if properly treated throve and were safer than among their enemies at home such was the argument for slavery and it was true so far as it went the argument against on the score of ill-treatment was only gradually heard on the score of general human rights it was never heard at all at departing in cutting the foresail lashings a marvellous misfortune happened to one of the officers in the ship who by the pulley of the sheet was slain out of hand Hawkins appointed all the masters of his ships in order for the keeping of good company in this manner, the small ships to be always ahead, and a weather of the Jesus, and to speak twice a day with the Jesus at least. If the weather be extreme, that the small ships cannot keep company with the Jesus, then all to keep company with the Solomon. If any happen to any misfortune, then to show two lights, and to shoot off a piece of ordnance. If any lose company, and come in sight again to make three yaws zigzags in their course and strike the mizzen three times serve god daily love one another preserve your victuals beware of fire and keep good company john spark the chronicler of this second voyage was full of curiosity over every strange sight he met with he was also blessed with the pen of a ready writer so we get a story that is more vivacious than hacklet's retelling of the first voyage or hawkins's own account of the third spark saw for the first time in his life negroes caribs indians alligators flying fish flamingos pelicans and many other strange sights having been told that florida was full of unicorns he at once concluded that it must also be full of lions for how could the one kind exist without the other kind to balance it spark was a soldier who never found his sea legs but his diary besides its other merits is particularly interesting as being the first account of america ever written by an english eye-witness hawkins made for teneriffe in the canaries off the west of africa there to everybody's great amaze the spaniards appeared levelling of bases small portable cannon and arquebuses with divers others to the number of fourscore with halberds pikes swords and targets but when it was found that hawkins had been taken for a privateer and when it is remembered that four hundred privateering vessels english and huguenot had captured seven hundred spanish prizes during the previous summer of fifteen hundred and sixty three there was and is less cause for amaze once explanations had been made peter de ponta gave master hawkins as gentle entertainment as if he had been his own brother peter was a traitor with a great eye for the main chance spark was lost in wonder over the famous arbol santo tree of faro by the dropping whereof the inhabitants and cattle are satisfied with water for other water they have none on the island this is not quite the traveller's tale it appears to be there are three springs on the island of teneriffe but water is scarce and the arbol santo a sort of gigantic laurel standing alone on a rocky ledge did actually supply two cisterns one for men and the other for cattle the morning mist condensing on the innumerable smooth leaves ran off and was caught in suitable conduits in africa hawkins took many sapies which do inhabit about rio grande now the jeba river which do jag their flesh both legs arms and bodies as workmanlike as a jerkin maker with us pinketh a jerkin it is a nice question whether these sapies gained or lost by becoming slaves to white men for they were already slaves to black conquerors who used them as meat with the vegetables they forced them to raise the sapies were sleek pacifists who found too late that the warlike samboses who inhabited the neighboring desert were not to be denied in the island of sambula we found almides or canoas which are made of one piece of wood digged out like a trough but of a good proportion being about eight yards long and one in breadth having a beak head and a stern very proportionably made and on the outside artificially carved and painted red and blue neither almady nor canoa is of course an african word one is arabic for a cradle el mad the other from which we get canoe is what the natives told columbus they call their dugouts and dugout canoes are very like primitive cradles 
thus spark was the first man to record in english from actual experience the aboriginal craft whose name both east and west was suggested to primeval man by the idea of his being literally rocked in the cradle of the deep hawkins did not have it all his own way with the negroes by whom he once lost seven of his own men killed and twenty-seven wounded but the captain in a singular wise manner carried himself with countenance very cheerful outwardly although inwardly his heart was broken in pieces for it done to this end that the portugals being with him should not presume to resist against him after losing five more men who were eaten by sharks hawkins shaped his course westward with a good cargo of negroes and other merchandises contrary winds and some tornadoes happened to us very ill but the almighty god who never suffereth his elect to perish sent us the ordinary breeze which never left us till we came to an island of the cannibals caribs of dominica who by the by had just eaten a shipload of spaniards hawkins found the spanish officials determined to make a show of resisting unauthorized trade but when he prepared one hundred men well armed with bows arrows arquebuses and pikes with which he marched townwards the officials let the sale of blacks go on hawkins was particularly anxious to get rid of his lean negroes who might die in his hands and become a dead loss so he used the gunboat argument to good effect spark kept his eyes open for side shows and was delighted with the alligators which he called crocodiles perhaps for the sake of the crocodile tears his nature is to cry and sob like a christian to provoke his prey to come to him and thereupon came this proverb that is applied unto women when they weep lacrimae crocodilly from the west indies hawkins made for florida which was then an object of exceptional desire among adventurous englishmen de soto one of pizarro's lieutenants had annexed it to spain and in fifteen hundred and thirty nine had started off inland to discover the supposed peru of north america three years later he had died while descending the valley of the mississippi six years later again the first spanish missionary in florida taking upon him to persuade the people to subjection was by them taken and his skin cruelly pulled over his ears and his flesh eaten hawkins's men had fair warning on the way for they being ashore found a dead man dried in a manner whole with other heads and bodies of men apparently smoked like hams but to return to our purpose as the indefatigable spark the captain in the ship's pinnace sailed along the shore and went into every creek speaking with divers of the floridians because he would understand where the frenchmen inhabited finally he found them in the river of may now st john's river and standing in thirty degrees and better there was great store of maize and mill and grapes of great bigness also deer great plenty which came upon the sands before them so here were the three rivals overlapping again the annexing spaniards the would-be colonizing french and the persistently trading english there were however no spaniards about at that time this was the second huguenot colony in florida rene de laudonniere had founded it in fifteen hundred and sixty four the first one founded two years earlier by jean ribaud had failed and ribaud's men had deserted the place they had started for home in fifteen hundred and sixty three had suffered terrible hardships had been picked up by an english vessel and taken some to france and some to england where the court was all agog about the wealth of florida people said there were mines so bright with jewels that they had to be approached at night lest the flashing light should strike men blind florida became proverbial and elizabethan wits made endless fun of it stolida or the land of fools and sordida or the land of muckworms were some of their jeux d'esprit every one was bound for florida whether he meant to go there or not despite spanish spheres of influence the native cannibals and pirates by the way hawkins on the contrary did not profess to be bound for florida nevertheless he arrived there and probably had intended to do so from the first for he took with him a frenchman who had been in ribaud's colony two years before and spark significantly says that the land is more than any one king christian is able to inhabit however this may be hawkins found the second french colony as well as a french ship of four score ton and two pinnaces of fifteen ton apiece by her and a fort in which their captain monsieur Lo 
donniere was with certain soldiers therein the colony had not been a success nor is this to be wondered at when we remember that most of the certain soldiers were ex-pirates who wanted gold and who would not take the pains so much as to fish in the river before their doors but would have all things put in their mouths eighty of the original two hundred went a-roving to the west indies where they spoiled the spaniards and were of such haughty stomachs that they thought their force to be such that no man durst meddle with them but god did endure it their hearts in such sort that they lingered so long that a spanish ship and galeasa being made out of san domingo took twenty of them whereof the most part were hanged and twenty-five escaped to florida where they were put into prison by Lodonier, against whom they had mutinied and four of the chiefest being condemned at the request of the soldiers did pass the arquebusers and then were hanged upon a gibbet spark got the delightful expression at the request of the soldiers did pass the arquebusers from a very polite frenchman could any one tell you more politely in mistranslated language how to stand up and be shot spark was greatly taken with the unknown art of smoking the floridians have an herb dried who with a cane and an earthen cup in the end with fire and the dried herbs put together do suck through the cane the smoke thereof which smoke satisfieth their hunger and therewith they live four or five days without meat or drink and this all the frenchmen use for this purpose yet do they hold opinion withal that it causeth water and steam to void from their stomachs the other commodities of the land were more than are yet known to any man but hawkins was bent on trade not colonizing he sold the tiger a bark of fifty tons to la Donier for seven hundred crowns and sailed north on the first voyage ever made along the coast of the united states by an all-english crew turning east off newfoundland with a good large wind the twenty to september fifteen hundred and sixty-five we came to padstow in cornwall god be thanked in safety with the loss of twenty persons in all the voyage and with great profit to the venturers as also to the whole realm in bringing home both gold and silver pearls and other jewels great store his name therefore be praised for evermore amen hawkins was now a rich man a favourite at court and quite the rage in london the queen was very gracious and granted him the well-known coat of arms with the crest of a demi moor bound and captive in honour of the great new english slave trade the spanish ambassador met him at court and asked him to dinner where over the wine hawkins assured him that he was going out again next year meanwhile however the famous captain-general of the indian trade don pedro menendez de aviles the best naval officer that spain perhaps has ever had swooped down on the french in florida killed them all and built the fort of st augustine to guard the mountains of bright stone somewhere in the hinterland news of this slaughter soon arrived at madrid whence orders presently went out to have an eye on hawkins whom spanish officials thenceforth regarded as the leading interloper in new spain nevertheless hawkins set out on his third and very troublesome voyage in fifteen hundred and sixty seven backed by all his old and many new supporters and with a flotilla of six vessels the jesus the minion which then meant darling the william and john the judith the angel and the swallow this was the voyage that began those twenty years of sea-dog fighting which rose to their zenith in the battle against the armada and with this voyage drake himself steps on to the stage as captain of the judith there had been a hitch in fifteen hundred and sixty six for the spanish ambassador has reported hawkins's after-dinner speech to his king philip had protested to elizabeth and elizabeth had consulted with cecil afterwards the great lord burleigh ancestor of the marquis of salisbury british prime minister during the spanish-american war of eighteen hundred and ninety eight the result was that orders went down to plymouth stopping hawkins and binding him over in a bond of five hundred pounds to keep the peace with her majesty's right good friend king philip of spain but in fifteen hundred and sixty seven times had changed again and hawkins sailed with colours flying for elizabeth was now as ready to hurt philip as he was to hurt her provided always that open war was carefully avoided but this time things went wrong from the first a tremendous autumnal storm scattered the ships then the first negroes that hawkins tried to snare proved to be like that other kind of prey of which the sarcastic frenchman wrote this animal is very wicked when you attack it it defends itself 
the envenomed arrows of the negroes worked the mischief there hardly escaped any that had blood drawn of them but died in strange sort with their mouths that shut some ten days before they died hawkins himself was wounded but thanks be to god escaped the lockjaw after this the english took sides in a native war and captured two hundred and fifty persons men women and children while their friend the king captured six hundred prisoners whereof we hoped to have had our choice but the negro in which nation is seldom or never found truth that night removed his camp and prisoners so that we were fain to content ourselves with those few we had gotten ourselves however with between four hundred and five hundred negroes hawkins crossed over from africa to the west indies and coasted from place to place making our traffic with the spaniards as we might somewhat hardly because the king had straitly commanded all his governors by no means to suffer any trade to be made with us notwithstanding we had reasonable trade and courteous entertainment for a good part of the way in rio de la hacha the spaniards received the english with a volley that killed a couple of men whereupon the english smashed in the gates while the spaniards retired but after this little bit of punctilio trade went on under cover of night so briskly that two hundred negroes were sold at good prices from there to cartagena the inhabitants were glad of us and traded willingly supply being short and demand extra high then came a real rebuff from the governor of cartagena followed by a terrific storm which so beat the jesus that we cut down all her higher buildings deck superstructures then the course was shaped for florida but a new storm drove the battered flotilla back to the port which serveth the city of mexico called st john de ulia the modern vera cruz the historic vera cruz was fifty miles north of this harbor here thinking us to be the fleet of spain the chief officers of the country came aboard us which being deceived of their expectation were greatly dismayed but when they saw our demand was nothing but victuals, were recomforted i for it is hawkins own story found in the same port twelve ships which had in them by report two hundred thousand pounds in gold and silver all which being in my possession that is at my mercy with the king's island i set at liberty what was to be done hawkins had a hundred negroes still to sell but it was four hundred miles to mexico city and back again and a new spanish viceroy was aboard the big spanish fleet that was daily expected to arrive in this very port if a permit to sell came back from the capital in time well and good if no more than time to replenish stores was allowed good enough despite the loss of sales but what if the spanish fleet arrived the king's island was a low little reef right in the mouth of the harbour which it all but barred moreover no vessel could live through a northerly gale inside the harbour the only one on that coast unless securely moored to the island itself consequently whoever held the island commanded the situation altogether there was not much time for consultation for the very next morning we saw open of the haven thirteen great ships the fleet of spain it was a terrible predicament now said i i am in two dangers and forced to receive the one of them either i must have kept out the fleet which with god's help i was very well able to do or else suffer them to enter with their accustomed treason if i had kept them out then there had been present shipwreck of all that fleet which amounted in value to six millions which was in value of our money one million eight hundred thousand pounds which i considered i was not able to answer fearing the queen's majesty's indignation thus with myself revolving the doubts i thought better to abide the jut of the uncertainty than of the certainty so after conditions had been agreed upon and hostages exchanged the thirteen spanish ships sailed in the little island remained in english hands and the spaniards were profuse in promises but having secretly made their preparations the spaniards who were in overwhelming numbers suddenly set upon the english by land and sea every englishman ashore was killed except a few who got off in a boat to the jesus the jesus and the minion cut their head fast hauled clear by their stern fasts drove back the boarding parties and engaged the spanish fleet at about a hundred yards within an hour the spanish flagship and another were sunk a third vessel was burning furiously fore and aft while every english deck was clear of enemies but the spaniards had swarmed on to the island from all sides and were firing into the english hulls at only a few feet from the cannon's mouth hawkins was cool as ever calling for a tankard of beer he drank to the health of the gunners 
who accounted for most of the five hundred and forty men killed on the spanish side stand by your ordnance lustily he cried as he put the tankard down and a round shot sent it flying god hath delivered me he added and so will he deliver you from these traitors and villains the masts of the jesus went by the board and her old strained timbers splintered loosened up and were stove in under the storm of cannon balls hawkins then gave the order to abandon ship after taking out what stores they could and changing her berth so that she would shield the little minion but while this desperate manoeuvre was being executed down came two fire-ships some of the minions crew then lost their heads and made sail so quickly that hawkins himself was nearly left behind the only two english vessels that escaped were the minion and the judith when nothing else was left to do hawkins shouted to drake to lay the judith aboard the minion take in all the men and stores he could and put to sea drake then only twenty-three did this with consummate skill hawkins followed some time after and anchored just out of range but drake had already gained an offing that caused the two little vessels to part company in the night during which a whole gale from the north sprang up threatening to put the judith on a lee shore drake therefore fought his way to windward and seeing no one when the gale abated and having barely enough stores to make a friendly land sailed straight home hawkins reported the judith without mentioning drake's name as forsaking the minion but no other witness thought drake to blame hawkins himself rode out the gale under the lee of a little island then beat about for two weeks of increasing misery when highs were thought very good meat and rats cats mice and dogs parrots and monkeys that were got at great price none escaped the minion was of three hundred tons and so was insufferably overcrowded with three hundred men two hundred english and one hundred negroes drake's little judith of only fifty tons could have given no relief as she was herself over full hawkins asked all the men who preferred to take their chance on land to get round the foremast and all those who wanted to remain afloat to get round the mizzen about a hundred chose one course and a hundred the other the landing took place about a hundred and fifty miles south of the rio grande the shore party nearly all died but three lived to write of their adventures david ingram following indian trails all round the gulf of mexico and up the atlantic seaboard came out where st john new brunswick stands now was picked up by a passing frenchman and so got safely home job hortop and miles phillips were caught by the spaniards and sent back to mexico phillips escaped to england fourteen years later but hortop was sent to spain where he served twelve years as a galley slave and ten as a servant before he contrived to get aboard an english vessel the ten spanish hostages were found safe and sound aboard the jesus though by all the rules of war hawkins would have been amply justified in killing them the english hostages were kept fast prisoners if all the miseries of this sorrowful voyage says hawkins's report should be perfectly written there should need a painful man with his pen and as great a time as he had that wrote the lives and deaths of martyrs thus in complete disaster ended that third voyage to new spain on which so many hopes were set and with this disastrous end began those twenty years of sea-dog rage which found their satisfaction against the great armada end of chapter five chapter six of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six drake's beginning we must now turn back for a moment to fifteen hundred and forty five the year in which the old world after the discovery of the mines of potosi first awoke to the illimitable riches of the new the year in which king henry assembled his epic-making fleet the year too in which the british national anthem was so to say born at sea when the parole throughout the waiting fleet was god save the king and the answering counter's son was long to reign over us in the same year at crowndale by tavis stock in devon was born francis drake greatest of sea-dogs and first of modern admirals his father edmund drake was a skipper in modest circumstances but from time immemorial there had been drakes all round the countryside of tavistock and the family name stood high 
francis was called after his godfather francis russell son and heir of henry's right-hand reforming peer lord russell progenitor of the dukes of bedford down to the present day though fortune thus seemed to smile upon drake's cradle his boyhood proved to be a very stormy one indeed he was not yet five when the protestant zeal of the lord protector somerset stirred the roman catholics of the west country into an insurrection that swept the anti-papal minority before it like flotsam before a flood drake's father was a zealous protestant a hot gospeller much given to preaching and when he was cast up by the storm on what is now drake's island just off plymouth he was glad to take passage for kent his friends at court then made him a sort of naval chaplain to the men who took care of his majesty's ships laid up in gillingham reach on the river medway just below where chatham dockyard stands to-day here in a vessel too old for service most of drake's eleven brothers were born to a life as nearly amphibious as the life of any boy could be the tide runs in with a rush from the sea at sheerness only ten miles away and so among the creeks and marshes points and bends through tortuous channels and hurrying waters lashed by the keen east wind of england drake revelled in the kind of playground that a sea-dog's son should have during the reign of mary fifteen hundred and fifty three to fifty eight hot gospelers like drake's father were of course turned out of the service and so young francis had to be apprenticed to the master of a bark which he used to coast along the shore and sometimes to carry merchandise into zealand and france it was hard work and a rough life for the little lad of ten but drake stuck to it and so pleased the old man by his industry that being a bachelor at his death he bequeathed his bark unto him by will and testament moreover after elizabeth's accession drake's father came into his own he took orders in the church of england and in fifteen hundred and sixty one when francis was sixteen became vicar of upchurch on the medway the same river on which his boys had learned to live amphibious lives no dreams of any golden west had drake as yet to the boy in his teens westward ho meant nothing more than the usual cry of london boatmen touting for fares upstream but before he went out with sir john hawkins on the troublesome voyage which we have just followed he must have had a foretaste of something like his future raiding of the spanish main for the channel swarmed with protestant privateers no gentler when they caught a spaniard than spaniards were when they caught them he was twenty-two when he went out with hawkins and would be in his twenty-fourth year when he returned to england in the little judith after the murderous spanish treachery at san juan de ulia just as the winter night was closing in on the twentieth of january fifteen hundred and sixty nine the judith sailed into plymouth drake landed william hawkins john's brother wrote a petition to the queen and council for letters of mark in reprisal for ulua and drake dashed off for london with the missive almost before the ink was dry now it happened that a spanish treasure fleet carrying money from italy and bound for antwerp had been driven into plymouth and neighboring ports by huguenot privateers this money was urgently needed by alva the very capable but ruthless governor of the spanish netherlands who having just drowned the rebellious dutch in blood was now erecting a colossal statue to himself for having extinguished sedition chastised rebellion 
restored religion secured justice and established peace the spanish ambassador therefore obtained leave to bring it over land to dover but no sooner had elizabeth signed the order of safe conduct than in came drake with the news of san juan de ulua elizabeth at once saw that all the english sea-dogs would be flaming for revenge every one saw that the treasure would be safer now in england than aboard any spanish vessel in the channel so on the ground that the gold though payable to philip's representative in antwerp was still the property of the italian bankers who advanced it elizabeth sent orders down post haste to commandeer it the enraged ambassador advised alva to seize everything english in the netherlands elizabeth in turn seized everything spanish in england elizabeth now held the diplomatic trumps for existing treaties provided that there should be no reprisals without a reasonable delay and alva had seized english property before giving elizabeth the customary time to explain john hawkins entered plymouth five days later than drake and started for london with four pack-horses carrying all he had saved from the wreck by the irony of fate he travelled up to town in the rear of the long procession that carried the commandeered spanish gold the plot thickened fast for england was now on the brink of war with france over the secret aid englishmen had been giving to the huguenots at la rochelle but suddenly elizabeth was all smiles and affability for france and when her two great merchant fleets put out to sea one the wine fleet bound for la rochelle went with only a small naval escort just enough to keep the pirates off while the other the big wool fleet usually sent to antwerp but now bound for hamburg went with a strong fighting escort of regular men of war aboard this escort went francis drake as a lieutenant in the royal navy home in june drake ran down to tavistock in devon wooed won and married pretty mary newman all within a month he was back on duty in july for the time being the war cloud passed away elizabeth's tortuous diplomacy had succeeded owing to dissension among her enemies in the following year fifteen hundred and seventy the international situation was changed by the pope who issued a bull formally deposing elizabeth and absolving her subjects from their allegiance to her the french and spanish monarchs refused to publish this order because they did not approve of deposition by the pope but for all that it worked against elizabeth by making her the official standing enemy of rome at the same time it worked for her among the sea-dogs and all who thought with them the case said thomas fuller author of the worthies of england the case was clear in sea divinity religious zeal and commercial enterprise went hand in hand the case was clear and the english navy now mobilized and ready for war made it much clearer still westward ho in chief command at the age of twenty-five with the tiny flotilla of the dragon and the swan manned by as good a lot of daredevil experts as any privateer could wish to see out and back in fifteen hundred and seventy and again in fifteen hundred and seventy one drake took reprisals on new spain made money for all hands engaged and gained a knowledge of the american coast that stood him in good stead for future expeditions it was fifteen hundred and seventy two when drake at the age of twenty-seven sailed out of plymouth on the nombre de dios expedition that brought him into fame he led a lilliputian fleet the pasca and the swan a hundred tons between them with seventy-three men all ranks and ratings aboard of them 
but both vessels were richly furnished with victuals and apparels for a whole year and no less heedfully provided with all manner of ammunition artillery which then meant every kind of firearm as well as cannon artificers stuffs and tools but especially three dainty pinnaces made in plymouth taken asunder all in pieces and stowed aboard to be set up as occasion served without once striking sail drake made the channel between dominica and martinique in twenty-five days and arrived off a previously chosen secret harbour on the spanish main towards the end of july to his intense surprise a column of smoke was rising from it though there was no settlement within a hundred miles on landing he found a leaden plate with this inscription captain drake if you fortune to come to this port make haste away for the spaniards which you had with you here the last year have bewrayed the place and taken away all that you left here i depart hence this present seventh of july fifteen hundred and seventy two your very loving friend john garrett that was fourteen days before drake however was determined to carry out his plan so he built a fort and set up his pinnaces but others had now found the secret harbour for in came three sail under rance an englishman who asked that he be taken into partnership which was done then the combined forces not much over a hundred strong stole out and along the coast to the isle of pines where again drake found himself forestalled from the negro crews of two spanish vessels he discovered that only six weeks earlier the maroons had annihilated a spanish force on the isthmus and nearly taken nombre de dios itself these maroons were the descendants of escaped negro slaves intermarried with the most warlike of the indians they were regular desperadoes always and naturally at war with the spaniards who treated them as vermin to be killed at sight drake put the captured negroes ashore to join the maroons with whom he always made friends then with seventy-three picked men he made his dash for nombre de dios leaving the rest under rance to guard the base nombre de dios was the atlantic terminus as panama was the pacific terminus of the treasure trail across the isthmus of darien the spaniards knowing nothing of cape horn and unable to face the appalling dangers of magellan's straits used to bring the peruvian treasure ships to panama whence the treasure was taken across the isthmus to nombre de dios by recuas that is by mule trains under escort at evening drake's vessel stood off the harbour of nombre de dios and stealthily approached unseen it was planned to make the landing in the morning a long and nerve-racking wait ensued as the hours dragged on drake felt instinctively that his younger men were getting demoralized they began to whisper about the size of the town as big as plymouth with perhaps a whole battalion of the famous spanish infantry and so on it wanted an hour of the first real streak of dawn but just then the old moon sent a ray of light quivering in on the tide drake instantly announced the dawn issued the orders shove off out oars give way inside the bay a ship just arrived from sea was picking up her moorings a boat left her side and pulled like mad for the wharf but drake's men raced the spaniards beat them and made them sheer off to a landing some way beyond the town springing eagerly ashore the englishmen tumbled the spanish guns off their platforms while the astonished sentry ran for dear life in five minutes the church bells were pealing out their wild alarms trumpet calls were sounding drums were beating round the general parade and the civilians of the place 
expecting massacre at the hands of the maroons were rushing about in agonized confusion drake's men fell in they were all well drilled and were quickly told off into three detachments the largest under drake the next under oxenham the hero of kingsley's westward ho and the third of twelve men only to guard the pinnaces having found that the new fort on the hill commanding the town was not yet occupied drake and oxenham marched against the town at the head of their sixty men oxenham by a flank drake straight up the main street each with a trumpet sounding a drum rolling fire pikes blazing swords flashing and all ranks yelling like fiends drake was only of medium stature but he had the strength of a giant the pluck of a bulldog the spring of a tiger and the cut of a man that is born to command broad-browed with steel-blue eyes and close-cropped auburn hair and beard he was all kindliness of countenance to friends but a very dragon to his spanish foes as drake's men reached the plaza his trumpeter blew one blast of defiance and then fell dead drake returned the spanish volley and charged immediately the drummer beating furiously pikes leveled and swords brandished the spaniards did not wait for him to close for oxenham's party fire pikes blazing were taking them in flank out went the spaniards through the panama gate with screaming townsfolk scurrying before them bang went the gate now under english guard as drake made for the governor's house there lay a pile of silver bars such as his men had never dreamt of in all about four hundred tons of silver ready for the homeward fleet enough not only to fill but sink the pasha swan and pinnaces but silver was then no more to drake than it was once to solomon what he wanted was the diamonds and pearls and gold which were stored he learned in the king's treasure-house beside the bay a terrific storm now burst the fire-pikes and arquebuses had to be taken under cover the wall of the king's treasure-house defied all efforts to breach it and the spaniards who had been shut into the town discovering how few the english were reformed for attack some of drake's men began to lose heart but in a moment he stepped to the front and ordered oxenham to go round and smash in the treasure-house gate while he held the plaza himself just as the men stepped off however he reeled aside and fell he had fainted from loss of blood caused by a wound he had managed to conceal there was no holding the men now they gave him a cordial after which he bound up his leg for he was a first-rate surgeon and repeated his orders as before but there were a good many wounded and with drake no longer able to lead the rest all begged to go back so back to their boats they went and over to the bastamentos or victualling island which contained the gardens and poultry runs of the nombre de dios citizens here they were visited under a flag of truce by the spanish officer commanding the reinforcement just sent across from panama he was all politeness airs and graces while trying to ferret out the secret of their real strength drake however was not to be outdone either in diplomacy or war and a delightful little comedy of prying and veiling courtesies was played out to the great amusement of the english sea-dogs finally when the time agreed upon was up the spanish officer departed pouring forth a stream of high-flown compliments which drake who was a spanish scholar answered with the like waving each other a ceremonious adieu the two leaders were left no wiser than before nombre de dios now strongly reinforced and on its guard was not an easy nut to crack but panama 
panama meant a risky march inland and a still riskier return by the regular treasure trail but with the help of the maroons who knew the furtive byways to a foot the thing might yet be done rance thought the game not worth the candle and retired from the partnership much to drake's delight a good preliminary stroke was made by raiding cartagena here drake found a frigate deserted by its crew who had gone ashore to see fair play in a duel fought about a seaman's mistress the old man left in charge confessed that a seville ship was round the point drake cut her out at once in spite of being fired at from the shore next in came two more spanish sail to warn cartagena that captain drake has been at nombre de dios and taken it and if a blessed bullet hadn't hit him in the leg he would have sacked it too cartagena however was up in arms already so drake put all his prisoners ashore unhurt and retired to reconsider his position leaving diego a negro fugitive from nombre de dios to muster the maroons for a raid overland to panama then drake who sank the swan and burnt his prizes because he had only men enough for the pasha and the pinnaces disappeared into a new secret harbor but his troubles were only beginning for word came that the maroons said that nothing could be done inland till the rains were over five months hence this meant a long wait however what with making supply depots and picking up prizes here and there the wet time might pass off well enough one day oxenham's crew nearly mutinied over the shortness of provisions have ye not as much as i drake called to them and as god's providence ever failed us yet within an hour a spanish vessel hove in sight making such very heavy weather of it that boarding her was out of the question but we spent not two hours in attendance till it pleased god to send us a reasonable calm so that we might use our guns and approach her at pleasure we found her laden with victuals, which we received as sent of god's great mercy then yellow jack broke out and the men began to fall sick and die the company consisted of seventy-three men and twenty-eight of these perished of the fever among them the surgeon himself and drake's own brother but on the third of february fifteen hundred and seventy-three drake was ready for the dash on panama leaving behind about twenty-five men to guard the base he began the overland march with a company of fifty all told of whom thirty-one were picked maroons the fourth day out drake climbed a forest giant on the top of the divide saw the atlantic behind him and the pacific far in front and vowed that if he lived he would sail an english ship over the great south sea two days more and the party left the protecting forest for the rolling pampas where the risk of being seen increased at every step another day's march and panama was sighted as they topped the crest of one of the bigger waves of ground a clever maroon went ahead to spy out the situation and returned to say that two recuas would leave at dusk one coming from venta cruz fifteen miles northwest of panama carrying silver and supplies and the other from panama loaded with jewels and gold then a spanish sentry was caught asleep by the advance party of maroons who smelt him out by the match of his firelock in his gratitude for being protected from the maroons this man confirmed the previous information the excitement now was most intense for the crowning triumph of a two years great adventure was at last within striking distance of the english crew drake drew them up in proper order and every man took off his shirt and put it on again outside his coat so that each would recognize the others in the night attack then they lay listening for the mule bells till presently the warning tinkle let them know that recuas were approaching from both venta cruz and panama 
the first or silver train from venta cruz was to pass in silence only the second or gold train from panama was to be attacked unluckily one of the englishmen had been secretly taking pulls at his flask and had just become pot valiant when a stray spanish gentleman came riding up from venta cruz the englishman sprang to his feet swayed about was tripped up by maroons and promptly sat upon but the spaniard saw his shirt reined up whipped round and galloped back to panama this took place so silently at the extreme flank in towards panama that it was not observed by drake or any other englishman presently what appeared to be the gold train came within range drake blew his whistle and all set on with glee only to find that the panama recua they were attacking was a decoy sent on to spring the trap and that the gold and jewels had been stopped the spaniards were up in arms but drake slipped away through the engulfing forest and came out on the atlantic side where he found his rear guard intact and eager for further exploits he was met by captain tetu a huguenot just out from france with seventy men tetu gave drake news of the massacre of st bartholomew and this drew the french and english protestants together they agreed to engage in further raiding of spaniards share and share alike by nationalities though drake had now only thirty-one men against tetu's seventy nombre de dios they decided was not vulnerable as all the available spanish forces were concentrated there for its defence and so they planned to seize a spanish train of gold and jewels just far enough inland to give them time to get away with the plunder before the garrison could reach them somewhere on the coast they established a base of operations and then marched overland to the panama trail and lay in wait this time the marauders were successful when the spanish train of gold and jewels came opposite the ambush drake's whistle blew the leading mules were stopped the rest lay down as mule trains will the guard was overpowered after killing a maroon and wounding captain tetu and when the garrison of nombre de dios arrived a few hours later the gold and jewels had all gone for a day and a night and another day drake and his men pushed on loaded with plunder back to their rendezvous along the coast leaving tetu and two of his devoted frenchmen to be rescued later when they arrived worn out at the rendezvous not a man was in sight drake built a raft out of unhewn tree trunks and setting up a biscuit bag as a sail pushed out with two frenchmen and one englishman till he found his boats the plunder was then divided up between the french and the english while oxenham headed a rescue party to bring tetu to the coast one frenchman was found but tetu and the other had been caught by spaniards the pasha was given to the accumulated spanish prisoners to sail away in the pinnaces were kept till a suitable smart sailing spanish craft was found boarded and captured to replace them whereupon they were broken up and their metal given to the maroons then in two frigates with ballast of silver and cargo of jewels and gold the thirty survivors of the adventure set sail for home within twenty-three days we passed from the cape of florida to the isles of scilly and so arrived at plymouth on sunday about sermon time august nine fifteen hundred and seventy three at what time the news of our captain's return brought unto his friends did so speedily pass over all the church and surpass their minds with desire to see him that very few or none remained with the preacher all hastening to see the evidence of god's love and blessing towards our gracious queen and country by the fruit of our captain's labor and success soli deo gloria End of chapter six chapter seven of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven 
drake's encompassment of all the world when drake left for nombre de dios in the spring of fifteen hundred and seventy two spain and england were both ready to fly at each other's throats when he came back in the summer of fifteen hundred and seventy three they were all for making friends hypocritically so but friends drake's plunder stank in the nostrils of the haughty dons it was a very inconvenient factor in the diplomatic problem for elizabeth therefore drake disappeared and his plunder too he went to ireland on service in the navy his plunder was divided up in secrecy among the high and low contracting parties in fifteen hundred and seventy four the anglo-spanish scene had changed again the spaniards had been so harassed by the english sea-dogs between the netherlands and spain that philip listened to his great admiral menendez who despairing of direct attack on england proposed to seize the scilly isles and from that naval base clear out a way through all the pirates of the english channel war seemed certain but a terrible epidemic broke out in the spanish fleet menendez died and philip changed his policy again this same year john oxenham drake's old second in command sailed over to his death the spaniards caught him on the isthmus of darien and hanged him as a pirate at lima in peru in the autumn of fifteen hundred and seventy five drake returned to england with a new friend thomas doughty a soldier scholar of the renaissance clever and good company but one of those italianate englishmen who gave rise to the italian proverb anglese italianato e diavolo incarnato an italianized englishman is the very devil doughty was patronized by the earl of essex who had great influence at court the next year fifteen hundred and seventy six is noted for the spanish fury philip's sea power was so hampered by the dutch and english privateers and he was so impotent against the english navy that he could get no ready money either by loan or from america to pay his troops in antwerp these men reinforced by others therefore mutinied and sacked the whole of antwerp killing all who opposed them and practically ruining the city from which charles v used to draw such splendid subsidies the result was a strengthening of dutch resistance everywhere elizabeth had been unusually torturous in her policy about this time but in fifteen hundred and seventy seven she was ready for another shot at spain provided always that it entailed no open war don john of austria natural son of charles v had all the shining qualities that his legitimate half-brother philip lacked he was the hero of lepanto and had offered to conquer the moors in tunis if philip would let him rule as king philip crafty cold and jealous of course refused and sent him to the netherlands instead here don john formed the still more aspiring plan of pacifying the dutch marrying mary queen of scots deposing elizabeth and reigning over all the british isles the pope had blessed both schemes but the dutch insisted on the immediate withdrawal of the spanish troops this demolished don john's plan but it pleased philip who could now ruin his brilliant brother by letting him wear himself out by trying to govern the netherlands without an army then the duke of anjou brother to the king of france came into the fast thickening plot at the head of the french rescuers of the netherlands from spain but a victorious french army in the netherlands was worse for england than even spanish rule there so elizabeth tried to support the dutch enough to annoy philip and at the same time keep them independent of the french in her desire to support them against philip indirectly she found it convenient to call drake 
into consultation drake then presented to sir francis walsingham his letter of commendation from the earl of essex under whom he had served in ireland whereupon secretary walsingham the first civilian who ever grasped the principle of modern sea power declared that her majesty had received divers injuries of the king of spain for which she desired revenge he showed me a plot map willing me to note down where he might be most annoyed but i refused to set my hand to anything affirming that her majesty was mortal and that if it should please god to take her majesty away that some prince might reign that might be in league with the king of spain and then would my own hand be a witness against myself elizabeth was forty-four mary queen of scots was watching for the throne plots and counterplots were everywhere shortly after this interview drake was told late at night that he should have audience of her majesty next day on seeing him elizabeth went straight to the point drake i would gladly be revenged on the king of spain for divers injuries that i have received and withal says drake craved my advice therein who told her majesty the only way was to annoy him by the indies on that he disclosed his whole daring scheme for raiding the pacific elizabeth who like her father loved a man who was a man fell in with this at once secrecy was of course essential her majesty did swear by her crown that if any within her realm did give the king of spain to understand hereof they should lose their heads therefore at a subsequent audience her majesty gave me special commandment that of all men my lord treasurer should not know of it the cautious lord treasurer burley was against what he considered dangerous forms of privateering and was for keeping on good terms with spanish arms and trade as long as possible mendoza lynx-eyed ambassador of spain was hoodwinked but dowdy the viper in drake's bosom was meditating mischief not exactly treason with spain but at least a breach of confidence by telling burley de guaris chief spanish spy in england was sorely puzzled drake's ostensible destination was egypt and his men were openly enlisted for alexandria the spaniards however saw far enough through this to suppose that he was really going back to nombre de dios it did not seem likely though quite possible that he was going in search of the northwest passage for martin frobisher had gone out on that quest the year before and had returned with a lump of black stone from the arctic desolation of baffin island no one seems to have divined the truth cape horn was unknown the strait of magellan was supposed to be the only opening between south america and a huge antarctic continent and its reputation for disasters had grown so terrible and rightly terrible that it had been given up as the way into the pacific the spanish way as we have seen was overland from nombre de dios to panama more or less along the line of the modern panama canal in the end drake got away quietly enough on the fifteenth of november fifteen hundred and seventy seven the court and country were in great excitement over the conspiracy between the spaniards and mary queen of scots now a prisoner of nine years standing the famous voyage of sir francis drake in the south sea and there hence about the whole globe of the earth begun in the year of our lord fifteen hundred and seventy seven well deserves its great renown drake's flotilla seems absurdly small but for its own time it was far from insignificant and it was exceedingly well found the pelican afterwards called the golden hind though his flagship was of only a hundred tons the elizabeth the swan the marigold and the benedict were of eighty fifty thirty and fifteen there were altogether less than three hundred tons and two hundred men the crews numbered a hundred and fifty the rest were gentlemen adventurers special artificers two trained surveyors musicians boys in drake's own page jack drake there was great store of wildfire chain shot harquebuses pistols corslets bows and other like weapons in great abundance 
Neither had he omitted to make provision for ornament and delight, carrying with him expert musicians, rich furniture, all the vessels for his table, yea, many belonging even to the cook-room, being of pure silver, and divers shows of all sorts of curious workmanship, whereby the civility and magnificence of his native country might, amongst all nations, whithersoever he should come, be the more admired. Sow, sow west went Drake's flotilla, and made its landfall towards the pole Antarctic, off the land of devils, in thirty-one degrees, forty minutes south, northeast of Montevideo frightful storms had buffeted the little ships about for weary weeks together and all hands thought they were the victims of some magician on board perhaps the italianate dowdy or else of native witchcraft from the shore the experienced old pilot who was a portuguese explained that the natives had sold themselves to devils who were kinder masters than the spaniards and that now when they see ships they cast sand into the air whereof ariseth a most gross thick fog and palpable darkness and withal horrible fearful and intolerable winds rains and storms but witchcraft was not thomas doughty's real offence even before leaving england and after betraying elizabeth and drake to burley who wished to curry favour with the spanish traders rather than provoke the spanish power doughty was busy tampering with the men a storekeeper had to be sent back for peculation designed to curtail drake's range of action then doughty tempted officers and men talked up the terrors of magellan strait ran down his friend's authority and finally tried to encourage downright desertion by underhand means this was too much for drake doughty was arrested tied to the mast and threatened with dire punishment if he did not mend his ways but he would not mend his ways he had a brother on board and a friend a very crafty lawyer so stern measures were soon required drake held a sort of court-martial which condemned doughty to death then doughty having played his last card and lost determined to die like an officer and a gentleman drake solemnly pronounced him the child of death and persuaded him that he would by these means make him the servant of god doughty fell in with the idea and the former friends took the sacrament together for which master doughty gave him hearty thanks never otherwise terming him than my good captain chaplain fletcher having ended with the absolution drake and doughty sat down together as cheerfully as ever in their lives each cheering up the other and taking their leave by drinking to each other as if some journey had been in hand then drake and daddy went aside for a private conversation of which no record has remained after this doughty walked to the place of execution where like king charles the first he nothing common did or mean upon that memorable scene and so bidding the whole company farewell he laid his head on the block lo this is the end of traitors said drake as the executioner raised the head aloft drake like magellan decided to winter where he was in port st julian on the east coast of patagonia his troubles with the men were not yet over for the soldiers resented being put on an equality with the sailors and the very crafty lawyer and doughty's brother were anything but pleased with the turn events had taken then again the faint hearts murmured in their storm-beaten tents against the horrors of the awful straits so drake resolved to make things clear for good and all unfolding a document he began my masters i am a very bad orator for my bringing up hath not been in learning but what i shall speak here let every man take good notice of and let him write it down for i will speak nothing but i will answer it in england yea and before her majesty and i have it here already set down then after reminding them of the great adventure before them and saying that mutiny and dissension must stop at once he went on for by the life of god it doth even take my wits from me to think of it here is such controversy between the gentlemen and sailors that it doth make me mad to hear it i must have the gentleman to haul with the mariner and the mariner with the gentleman i would know him that would refuse to set his hand to a rope but i know there is not any such here to those whose hearts fail them he offered the marigold but let them go homeward for 
if i find them in my way i will surely sink them not a man stepped forward then turning to the officers he discharged every one of them for reappointment at his pleasure next he made the worst offenders the crafty lawyer included step to the front for reprimand finally producing the queen's commission he ended by a ringing appeal to their united patriotism we have set by the ears three mighty princes the sovereigns of england spain and portugal and if this voyage should not have success we should not only be a scorning unto our enemies but a blot on our country for ever what triumph would it not be for spain and portugal the like of this would never more be tried then he gave back every man his rank again explaining that he and they were all servants of her majesty together with this the men marched off loyal and obedient to their tents next week drake sailed for the much dreaded straits before entering which he changed the pelican's name to the golden hind which was the crest of sir christopher hatton one of the chief promoters of the enterprise and also one of doughty's patrons then every vessel struck her topsail to the bunt in honour of the queen as well as to show that all discoveries and captures were to be made in her sole name seventeen days of appalling dangers saw them through the straits where icy squalls came rushing down from every quarter of the baffling channels but the pacific was still worse for no less than fifty-two consecutive days a furious gale kept driving them about like so many bits of driftwood the like of it no traveller hath felt neither hath there ever been such a tempest since noah's flood the little english vessels fought for their very lives in that devouring hell of waters the loneliest and most stupendous in the world the marigold went down with all hands and parson fletcher who heard their dying call thought it was a judgment at last the gale abated near cape horn where drake landed with a compass while parson fletcher set up a stone engraved with the queen's name and the date of the discovery deceived by the false trend of the coast shown on the spanish charts drake went a long way northwest from cape horn then he struck in northeast and picked up the chilean islands it was december fifteen hundred and seventy eight but not a word of warning had reached the spanish pacific when drake stood into valparaiso seeing a sail the crew of the grand captain of the south got up a cask of wine and beat a welcome on their drums in the twinkling of an eye gigantic tom moon was over the side at the head of a party of boarders who laid about them with a will and soon drove the spaniards below half a million dollars worth of gold and jewels was taken with this prize drake then found a place in salado bay where he could clean the golden hind while the pinnace ranged south to look for the other ships that had parted company during the two months storm these were never found the elizabeth and the swan having gone home after parting company in the storm that sank the marigold after a prolonged search the golden hind stood north again meanwhile the astounding news of her arrival was spreading dismay all over the coast where the old spanish governor's plans were totally upset the indians had just been defeated when this strange ship came sailing in from nowhere to the utter confusion of their enemies the governor died of vexation and all the spanish authorities were nearly worried to death they had never dreamt of such an invasion their crews were small their lumbering vessels very lightly armed their towns unfortified but drake went faster by sea than their news by land every vessel was overhauled taken searched emptied of its treasure and then sent back with his crew and passengers at liberty one day a watering party chanced upon a spaniard from potosi fast asleep with thirteen bars of silver by him the bars were lifted quietly and the spaniard left sleeping peacefully another spaniard suddenly came round a corner with half a ton of silver on eight llamas the indians came off to trade and drake as usual made friends with them at once 
he had already been attacked by other indians on both coasts but this was because the unknown english had been mistaken for the hated spaniards as he neared lima drake quickened his pace lest the great annual treasure ship of fifteen hundred and seventy nine should get wind of what was wrong a minor treasure ship was found to have been cleared of all her silver just in time to balk him so he set every stitch of canvas she possessed and left her driving out to sea with two other empty prizes then he stole into lima after dark and came to anchor surrounded by spanish vessels not one of which had set a watch they were found nearly empty but a ship from panama looked promising so the pinnace started after her but was fired on and an englishman was killed drake then followed her after cutting every cable in the harbour which soon became a pandemonium of vessels gone adrift the panama ship had nothing of great value except her news which was that the great treasure ship nuestra senora de la concepcion the chiefest glory of the whole south sea was on her way to panama she had a very long start and as ill luck would have it drake got becalmed outside Calleo, where the bells rang out in wild alarm the news had spread inland and the viceroy of peru came hurrying down with all the troops that he could muster finding from some arrows that the strangers were englishmen he put four hundred soldiers into the only two vessels that had escaped the general wreck produced by drake's cutting of the cables when drake saw the two pursuing craft he took back his prize crew from the panama vessel into which he put his prisoners meanwhile a breeze sprang up and he soon drew far ahead the spanish soldiers overhauled the panama prize and gladly gave up the pursuit they had no guns of any size with which to fight the golden hind and most of them were so seasick from the heaving ground swell that they couldn't have boarded her in any case three more prizes were then taken by the swift golden hind each one had news which showed that drake was closing on the chase another week passed with every stitch of canvas set a fourth prize taken off cape san francisco said that the treasure ship was only one day ahead but she was getting near to panama so every nerve was strained anew presently jack drake the captain's page yelled out sail ho and scrambled down the mainmast to get the golden chain that drake had promised to the first lookout who saw the chase it was ticklish work so near to panama and local winds might ruin all so drake in order not to frighten her trailed a dozen big empty wine jars over the stern to moderate his pace at eight o'clock the jars were cut adrift and the golden hind sprang forward with the evening breeze her crew at battle quarters and her decks all cleared for action the chase was called the spitfire by the spaniards because she was much better armed than any other vessel there but all the same her armament was nothing for her tonnage the spaniards trusted to their remoteness for protection and that was their undoing to every englishman's amazement the chase was seen to go about and calmly come to hail the golden hind which she mistook for a dispatch vessel sent after her with some message from the viceroy drake asking nothing better ran up alongside as anton her captain hailed him with ah who are you a ship of chile answered drake anton looked down on the stranger's deck to see it full of armed men from whom a roar of triumph came english strike sail then drake's whistle blew sharply and instant silence followed on which he hailed don anton strike sail senor juan de anton or i must send you to the bottom come aboard and do it yourself bravely answered anton drake's whistle blew one shrill long blast which loosed a withering volley at less than point blank range anton tried to bear away and shake off his assailant but in vain the english guns now opened on his masts and rigging down came the mizzen while a hail of english shot and arrows prevented every attempt to clear away the wreckage the dumbfounded spanish crew ran below don anton looked over side to port and there was the english pinnace from which forty english boarders were nimbly climbing up his own ship's side resistance was hopeless so anton struck and was taken aboard 
the golden hind there he met drake who was already taking off his armour accept with patience the usage of war said drake laying his hand on anton's shoulder for all that night next day and the next night following drake sailed west with his fabulous prize so as to get well clear of the trade route along the coast what the whole treasure was has never been revealed but it certainly amounted to the equivalent of many millions at the present day among the official items were thirteen chests of pieces of eight eighteen pounds of pure gold jewels and plate twenty-six ton weight of silver and sundries unspecified as the spanish pilot's son looked over the rail at this astounding sight the englishman called out to say that his father was no longer the pilot of the old spitfire but of the new spit silver the prisoners were no less gratified than surprised by drake's kind treatment he entertained don anton at a banquet took him all over the golden hind and entrusted him with a message to don martin the traitor of san juan de Ulua. this was to say that if don martin hanged any more englishmen as he had just hanged oxenham he should soon be given a present of two thousand spanish heads then drake gave every spanish officer and man a personal gift proportioned to his rank put all his accumulated prisoners aboard the emptied treasure-ship wished them a prosperous voyage and better luck next time furnished the brave don anton with a letter of protection in case he should fall in with an english vessel and after many expressions of goodwill on both sides sailed north the voyage made while the poor spitsilver treasure-ship turned sadly east and steered for panama lima panama and nombre de dios were in wild commotion at the news and every sailor and soldier that the spaniards had was going to and fro uncertain whether to attack or to defend and still more distracted as to the most elusive english whereabouts one good spanish captain don pedro sarmiento de gamboa was all for going north his instinct telling him that drake would not come back among the angry bees after stealing all the honey but by the time the captain-general of new spain had made up his mind to take one of the many wrong directions he had been thinking of drake was already far on his way north to found new albion drake's triumph over all difficulties had won the hearts of his men more than ever before while the capture of the treasure-ship had done nothing to loosen the bonds of discipline don francisco de zarati wrote a very intimate account of his experience as a prisoner on board the golden hind the english captain is one of the greatest mariners at sea alike from his skill and his powers of command his ship is a very fast sailor and her men are all skilled hands of warlike age and so well trained that they might be old soldiers of the italian tertias the crack corps of the age of spanish eyes he is served with much plate and has all possible kinds of delicacies and scents many of which he says the queen of england gave him none of the gentlemen sit or cover in his presence without first being ordered to do so they dine and sup to the music of violins his galleon carries about thirty guns and a great deal of ammunition this was in marked contrast to the common spanish practice even on the atlantic side the greedy exploiters of new spain grudged every ton of armament and every well-trained fighting sailor both on account of the expense and because this form of protection took up room they wished to fill with merchandise the result was of course that they lost more by capture than they gained by evading the regulation about the proper armament his ship is not only of the very latest type but sheathed before copper sheathing was invented some generations later the teredo worm used to honeycomb unprotected hulls in the most dangerous way john hawkins invented the sheathing used by drake a good thick tar and hair sheathing clamped on with elm northwest to coronado then to aguatulco then fifteen hundred miles due west brought drake about that distance south by east of the modern san francisco 
Here he turned north northwest, and giving the land a wide berth, went on to perhaps the latitude of Vancouver Island, always looking for the reverse way through America by the fabled northwest passage. Either there was the most extraordinary June ever known in California and Oregon, or else the narratives of those on board have all been hopelessly confused, for freezing rain is said to have fallen on the night of June the 3rd in the latitude of 42 degrees. In 48 degrees there followed the most vile, thick, and stinking fogs, with still more numbing cold the meat froze when taken off the fire the wet rigging turned to icicles six men could hardly do the work of three fresh from the tropics the crews were unfit for going any farther a tremendous nor'wester settled the question anyway and drake ran south to thirty eight degrees thirty minutes where in what is now drake's bay he came to anchor just north of san francisco not more than once if ever at all and that a generation earlier had europeans been in northern california the indians took the englishmen for gods whom they knew not whether to love or fear drake with the essential kindliness of most and the magnetic power of all great born commanders soon won the natives confidence but their admiration as men ravished in their minds was rather overpowering for after a kind of most lamentable weeping and crying out they came forward with various offerings for the new-found gods prostrating themselves in humble adoration and tearing their breasts and faces in a wild desire to show the spirit of self-sacrifice drake and his men all protestants were horrified at being made what they considered idols so kneeling down they prayed aloud raising hands and eyes to heaven hoping thereby to show the heathen where the true god lived drake then read the bible and all the englishmen sang psalms the indians observing the end of every pause with one voice still cried oh greatly rejoicing in our exercises as this impromptu service ended the indians gave back all the presents drake had given them and retired in attitudes of adoration in three days more they returned headed by a medicine man whom the english called the mace-bearer with the slow and stately measure of a mystic dance this great high priest of heathen rites advanced chanting a sort of litany both litany and dance were gradually taken up by tens by hundreds and finally by all the thousands of the devotees who addressed drake with shouts of hi-yo and invested him with a headdress of rare plumage and a necklace of quaint beads it was in fact a native coronation without a soul to doubt the divine right of their new king drake's protestant scruples were quieted by thinking to what good end god had brought this to pass and what honour and profit it might bring to our country in time to come so in the name and to the use of her most excellent majesty he took the sceptre crown and dignity and proclaimed an english protectorate over the land he called new albion he then set up a brass plate commemorating this proclamation and put an english coin in the middle so that the indians might see elizabeth's portrait and armorial device the exaltation of the ecstatic devotees continued till the day he left they crowded in to be cured by the touch of his hand those were the times in which the sovereign was expected to cure the king's evil by a touch they also expected to be cured by inhaling the divine breath of any one among the english gods the chief narrator adds that the gods who pleased the indians most braves and squaws included were commonly the youngest of us which shows that the human was not quite forgotten in the all divine when the time for sailing came the devotees were inconsolable they not only in a sudden did lose all mirth joy glad countenance pleasant speeches agility of body and all pleasure but with sighs and sorrowings they poured out woeful complaints and moans with bitter tears and wringing of their hands and tormenting of themselves the last the english saw of them was the whole devoted tribe assembled on the hill around a sacrificial fire whence they implored their gods to bring their heaven back to earth 
from california drake sailed to the philippines and then to the moluccas where the portuguese had if such a thing were possible outdone even the spaniards in their fiendish dealings with the natives lopez de mosquito viler than his pestilential name had murdered the sultan who was then his guest chopped up the body and thrown it into the sea Baybar, the sultan's son had driven out the portuguese from the island of ternate and was preparing to do likewise from the island of tidore when drake arrived Baybar then offered drake for queen elizabeth the complete monopoly of the trade in spices if only drake would use the golden hind as the flagship against the portuguese drake's reception was full of oriental state and sultan Baybar was so entranced by drake's musicians that he sat all afternoon among them in a boat towed by the golden hind but it was too great a risk to take a hand in this new war with only fifty-six men left so drake traded for all the spices he could stow away and concluded a sort of understanding which formed the sheet anger of english diplomacy in eastern seas for another century to come elizabeth was so delighted with this result that she gave drake a cup still at the family seat at nutwell court in devonshire engraved with a picture of his reception by the sultan Baybar of ternate leaving ternate the golden hind beat to and fro among the tortuous and only half-known channels of the archipelago till the ninth of january fifteen hundred and eighty when she bore away before a roaring trade wind with all sails set and so far as drake could tell a good clear course for home but suddenly without a moment's warning there was a most terrible shock the gallant ship reared like a stricken charger plunged forward grinding her trembling hull against the rocks and then lay pounding out her life upon a reef drake and his men at once took in half the straining sails then knelt in prayer then rose to see what could be done by earthly means to their dismay there was no holding ground on which to get an anchor fast and warp the vessel off the lead could find no bottom anywhere aft all night long the golden hind remained fast caught in this insidious death-trap at dawn parson fletcher preached a sermon and administered the blessed sacrament then drake ordered ten tons overboard cannon cloves and provisions the tide was now low and she sewed seven feet her draught being thirteen and the depth of water only six still she kept an even keel as the reef was to leeward and she had just sail enough to hold her up but at high tide in the afternoon there was a lull and she began to heel over towards the unfathomable depths just then however a quiver ran through her from stem to stern an extra sail that drake had ordered up caught what little wind there was and with the last throb of the rising tide she shook herself free and took the water as quietly as if her hull was being launched there were perils enough to follow dangers of navigation the arrival of a portuguese fleet that was only just eluded and all the ordinary risks of travel in times when what might be called the official guide to voyagers opened with the ominous advice first make thy will but the greatest had now been safely passed meanwhile all sorts of rumours were rife in spain new spain and england drake had been hanged that rumour came from the hanging of john oxenham at lima the golden hind had foundered that tale was what winter captain of the elizabeth was not altogether unwilling should be thought after his own failure to face another great antarctic storm he had returned in fifteen hundred and seventy eight news from peru and mexico came home in fifteen hundred and seventy nine but no drake so as fifteen hundred and eighty wore on his friends began to despair the spaniards and portuguese rejoiced while burley with all who found drake an inconvenience in their diplomatic way began to hope that perhaps the sea had smoothed things over in august the london merchants were thrown into consternation by the report of drake's incredible captures for their own merchant fleet was just then off for spain they waited on the council who soothed them with the assurance that drake's voyage was a purely private venture so far as prizes were concerned with this diplomatic quibble they were forced to be content 
but worse was soon to follow the king of portugal died philip's army marched on lisbon immediately and all the portuguese possessions were added to the already overgrown empire of spain worse still this annexation gave philip what he wanted in the way of ships for portugal had more than spain the great armada was now expected to be formed against england unless elizabeth's miraculous diplomacy could once more get her clear of the fast entangling coils to add to the general confusion this was also the year in which the pope sent his picked jesuits to england in which elizabeth was carrying on her last great international flirtation with ugly dissipated francis of anjou brother to the king of france into this imbroglio sailed the golden hind with ballast of silver and cargo of gold is her majesty alive and well said drake to the first sail outside of plymouth sound ay ay she is my master answered the skipper of a fishing smack but there's a deal o sickness here in plymouth on which drake ready for any excuse to stay afloat came to anchor in the harbour his wife pretty mary newman from the banks of tavy took boat to see him as did the mayor whose business was to warn him to keep quiet till his course was clear so drake wrote off to the queen and all the councillors who were on his side the answer from the councillors was not encouraging so he warped out quietly and anchored again behind drake's island in the sound but presently the queen's own message came commanding him to an audience at which she said she would be pleased to view some of the curiosities he had brought from foreign parts straight on that hint he started up to town with spices diamonds pearls and gold enough to win any woman's pardon and consent the audience lasted six hours meanwhile the council sat without any of drake's supporters and ordered all the treasure to be impounded in the tower but lester walsingham and hatton all members of drake's syndicate refused to sign while elizabeth herself the managing director suspended the order till her further pleasure should be known the spanish ambassador did burn with passion against drake the council was distractingly divided the london merchants trembled for their fleet but elizabeth was determined that the blow to philip should hurt him as much as it could without producing an immediate war while down among drake's own west countrymen the case was clear in sea divinity as similar cases had often been before tremaine a devonshire magistrate and friend of the syndicate could hardly find words to express his contentment with drake whom he called a man of great government and that by the rules of god and his book elizabeth decided to stand by drake she claimed what was true that he had injured no actual place or persons of the king of spain's nothing but property afloat appropriate for reprisals all england knew the story of ulua and approved of reprisals in accordance with the spirit of the age and the queen had a special grievance about ireland where the spaniards were entrenched in smerwick thus adding to the confusion of a rebellion that never quite died down at any time philip explained that the smerwick spaniards were there as private volunteers elizabeth answered that drake was just the same the english tide at all events was turning in his favour the indefatigable stowe chronicler of london records that the people generally applauded his wonderful long adventures and rich prizes his name and fame became admirable in all places the people swarming daily in the streets to behold him vowing hatred to all that misliked him the golden hind had been brought round to london where she was the greatest attraction of the day finally on the fourth of april fifteen hundred and eighty one elizabeth went on board in state to a banquet finer than has ever been seen in england since king henry the eighth said the furious spanish ambassador in his report to philip but this was not her chief offence in spanish eyes for here surrounded by her court and in the presence of an enormous multitude of her enthusiastic subjects she openly defied the king of spain he hath demanded drake's head of me she laughed aloud and here i have a gilded sword to strike it off with that she bade drake kneel then handing the sword to marchemont the special envoy of her french suitor francis of anjou she ordered him to give the accolade this done she pronounced the formula of immemorial fame i bid thee rise 
sir francis drake end of chapter seven chapter eight of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight drake clips the wings of spain for three years after drake had been dubbed sir francis by the queen he was the hero of every class of englishmen but two the extreme roman catholics who wanted mary queen of scots and the merchants who were doing business with portugal and spain the marian opposition to the general policy of england persisted for a few years longer but the merchants who were the inheritors of centuries of commercial intercourse with england's new enemies were soon to receive a shock that completely changed their minds they were themselves one of the strongest factors that made for war in the knotty problem now to be solved at the cannon's mouth because english trade was seeking new outlets in every direction and was beating hard against every door that foreigners shut in its face these merchants would not however support the war party till they were forced to as they still hoped to gain by other means what only war could win the year that drake came home one thousand five hundred and eighty philip at last got hold of a sea-going fleet the eleven big portuguese galleons taken when lisbon fell with the portuguese ships sailors and oversea possessions with more galleons under construction at santander in spain and with the galleons of the indian guard built by the great menendez to protect new spain with all this performed or promised philip began to feel as if the hour was at hand when he could do to england what she had done to him in one thousand five hundred and eighty three santa cruz the best spanish admiral since the death of menendez proposed to form the nucleus of the great armada out of the fleet with which he had just broken down the last vestige of portuguese resistance in the azores from that day on the idea was never dropped at the same time elizabeth discovered the paris plot between mary and philip and the catholics of france all of whom were bent on her destruction england stood to arms but false ideas of naval defence were uppermost in the queen's council no attempt was made to strike a concentrated blow at the heart of the enemy's fleet in his own waters instead of this the english ships were carefully divided among the three squadrons meant to defend the approaches to england ireland and scotland because as the queen in council sagely remarked who could be expected to know what the enemy's point of attack would be the fact is that when wielding the forces of the fleet and army the queen and most of her non-combatant counsellors never quite reached that supreme point of view from which the greatest statesmen see exactly where civil control ends and civilian interference begins luckily for england their mistakes were once more covered up by a turn of the international kaleidoscope no sooner had the immediate danger of a great combined attack on england passed away than elizabeth returned to drake's plan for a regular raid against new spain though it had to be one that was not designed to bring on war in europe drake who was a member of the navy board charged with the reorganization of the fleet was to have command the ships and men were ready but the time had not yet come next year one thousand five hundred and eighty four amadas and barlow sir walter raleigh's two prospectors for the plantation of virginia were being delighted with the summer lands and waters of what is now north carolina we shall soon hear more of raleigh and his vision of the west but at this time a good many important events were happening in europe and it is these that we must follow first william of orange the washington of holland was assassinated at philip's instigation while plots to kill elizabeth and place mary on the throne began to multiply the agents were executed while a bond of association was signed by all elizabeth's chief supporters binding them to hunt down and kill all who tried to kill her a plain hint for mary queen of scots to stop plotting or stand the consequences 
but the merchants trading with spain and portugal were more than ever for keeping on good terms with philip because the failure of the spanish harvest had induced him to offer them special protection and encouragement if they would supply his country's needs at once every available ton of shipping was accordingly taken up for spain the english merchant fleet went out and big profits seemed assured but presently the primrose a tall ship of london came flying home to say that philip had suddenly seized the merchandise imprisoned the men and taken the ships and guns for use with the great armada that was the last straw the peaceful traders now saw that they were wrong and that the fighting ones were right and for the first time both could rejoice over the clever trick by which john hawkins had got his own again from philip in one thousand five hundred and seventy one three years after don martin's treachery at san juan de ulua hawkins while commanding the silly island squadron led the spanish ambassador to believe that he would go over to the spanish cause in ireland if his claims for damages were only paid in full and all his surviving men in mexico were sent home the cold and crafty philip swallowed this tempting bait sent the men home with spanish dollars in their pockets and paid hawkins forty thousand pounds the worth of about two million dollars now then hawkins used the information he had picked up behind the spanish scenes to unravel the ridolfi plot for putting mary on the throne in one thousand five hundred and seventy two the year of st bartholomew no wonder philip hated sea dogs things new and old having reached this pass the whole of england bar the marians were eager for the great indies voyage of one thousand five hundred and eighty five londoners crowded down to woolwich with great jollity to see off their own contingent on its way to join drake's flag at plymouth very probably shakespeare went down too for that famous london merchantman the tiger to which he twice alludes once in macbeth and once in twelfth night was off with this contingent such a private fleet had never yet been seen twenty-one ships eight smart pinnaces and twenty-three hundred men of every rank and rating the queen was principal shareholder and managing director but as usual in colonial attacks intended for disavowal if necessity arose no prospectus or other document was published nor were the shareholders of this joint stock company known in any quite official way it was the size of the fleet and the reputation of the officers that made it a national affair drake now forty was admiral frobisher of northwest passage fame was vice nollies the queen's own cousin rear carlyle a famous general commanded the troops and sailed in shakespeare's tiger drake's old crew from the golden hind came forward to a man among them right that excellent mathematician and engineer and big tom moon the lion of all boarding parties each in command of a ship but elizabeth was just then weaving the threads of an unusually intricate diplomatic pattern so doubts and delays orders and counter-orders vexed drake to the last sir philip sidney too came down as a volunteer which was another sore vexation since his european fame would have made him practically joint commander of the fleet although he was not a naval officer at all but he had the good sense to go back whereupon drake fearing further interruptions from the court ordered everything to be tumbled into the nearest ships and hurried off to sea under a press of sail the first port of call was vigo in the northwestern corner of spain where drake's envoy told the astonished governor that elizabeth wanted to know what philip intended doing about embargoes now if the governor wanted peace he must listen to drake's arguments if war well drake was ready to begin at once a three days storm interrupted the proceedings after which the english intercepted the fugitive townsfolk whose flight showed that the governor meant to make a stand though he had said the embargo had been lifted and that all the english prisoners were at liberty to go some english sailors however were still being held so drake sent in an armed party and brought them off with a good pile of reprisal booty too then he put to sea and made for the spanish main by way of the portuguese african islands 
The plan of campaign drawn up for Burleigh's information still exists. It shows that Drake, the consummate raider, was also an admiral of the highest kind. The items, showing how long each part should take and what loot each place should yield, are exact and interesting. But it is in the relation of every part to every other part, and to the whole that the original genius of the born commander shines forth in all its glory after taking san domingo he was to sack margarita la hacha and santa marta raising their fortifications as he left cartagena and nombre de dios came next then carlisle was to raid panama with the help of the maroons while drake himself was to raid the coast of honduras finally with reunited forces he would take havana and if possible hold it by leaving a sufficient garrison behind thus he would paralyze new spain by destroying all the points of junction along its lines of communication just when philip stood most in need of its help for completing the great armada but like a meddlesome steeplechaser drake took a leap in his stride during the preliminary canter before the great race the wind being foul for the canaries he went on to the cape verde archipelago and captured santiago which had been abandoned in terror on the approach of the english dragon that sinister hero of lopa de vega's epic onslaught la dragontea as good luck would have it carlyle marched in on the anniversary of the queen's accession the seventeenth of november so there was a royal salute fired in her majesty's honour by land and sea no treasure was found french privateers had sacked the place three years before and had killed off every one they caught the portuguese however were not going to wait to meet the english dragon too the force that marched inland failed to unearth the governor so san domingo santiago and porto praya were all burnt to the ground before the fleet bore away for the west indies san domingo in hispaniola haiti was made in due course but only after a virulent epidemic had seriously thinned the ranks san domingo was the oldest town in new spain and was strongly garrisoned and fortified but carlyle's soldiers carried all before them drake battered down the seaward walls the spaniards abandoned the citadel at night and the english took the whole place as a new year's gift for one thousand five hundred and eighty six but again there was no treasure the spaniards had killed off the caribs in war or in the mines so that nothing was now dug out moreover the citizens were quite on their guard against adventurers and ready to hide what they had in the most inaccessible places drake then put the town up to ransom and sent out his own maroon boy servant to bring in the message from the spanish officer proposing terms this spaniard hating all maroons ran his lance through the boy and cantered away the boy came back with the last ounce of his strength and fell dead at drake's feet drake sent to say he would hang two spaniards every day if the murderer was not hanged by his own compatriots as no one came he began with two friars then the spaniards brought in the offender and hanged him in the presence of both armies that episode cleared the air and an interchange of courtesies and hospitalities immediately followed but no business was done drake therefore began to burn the town bit by bit till twenty-five thousand ducats were paid it was very little for the capital but the men picked up a good deal of loot in the process and vented their ultra-protestant zeal on all the graven images that were not worth keeping for sale on the whole the english were well satisfied they had taken all the spanish ships and armament they wanted destroyed the rest liberated over a hundred brawny galley slaves some turks among them all anxious for revenge and had struck a blow at spanish prestige which echoed back to europe spain never hid her light under a bushel and here in the governor's palace was a huge escutcheon with a horse standing on the earth and pawing at the sky the motto blazoned on it was to the effect that the earth itself was not enough for spain non sufficit orbis drake's humour was greatly tickled and he and his officers kept asking the spaniards to translate the motto again and again delays and tempestuous headwinds induced drake to let intermediate points alone and make straight for cartagena on the south american mainland cartagena had been warned and was on the alert it was strong by both nature and art 
the garrison was good of its kind though the spaniards custom of fighting in quilted jackets instead of armour put them at a disadvantage this custom was due to the heat and to the fact that the jackets were proof against the native arrows there was an outer and an inner harbour with such an intricate and well defended passage that no one thought drake would dare go in but he did frobisher had failed to catch a pilot but drake did the trick without one to the utter dismay of the spaniards after some more very clever manoeuvres to distract the enemy's attention from the real point of attack carlyle and the soldiers landed under cover of the dark and came upon the town where they were least expected by wading waist-deep through the water just out of sight of the spanish gunners the entrenchments did not bar the way in this unexpected quarter but wine casks full of rammed earth had been hurriedly piled there in case the mad english should make the attempt carlyle gave the signal goring's musketeers sprang forward and fired into the spaniards faces then sampson's pikemen charged through and a desperate hand-to-hand fight ensued finally the spaniards broke after carlyle had killed their standard-bearer and goring had wounded and taken their commander the enemies ran pell-mell through the town together till the english reformed in the plaza next day drake moved in to attack the harbour fort whereupon it was abandoned and the whole place fell but again there was a dearth of booty the spaniards were getting shy of keeping too many valuables where they could be taken so negotiations emphasized by piecemeal destruction went on till sickness and the lateness of the season put the english in a sorry fix the sack of the city had yielded much less than that of san domingo and the men who were all volunteers to be paid out of plunder began to grumble at their ill success many had been wounded several killed big faithful tom moon among them a hundred died more were ill two councils of war were held one naval the other military the military officers agreed to give up all their own shares to the men but the naval officers who were poorer and who were also responsible for the expenses of their vessels could not concur finally one hundred and ten thousand ducats equivalent in purchasing power to nearly three millions of dollars were accepted it was now impossible to complete the programme or even to take havana in view of the renewed sickness the losses and the advance of the season a further disappointment was experienced when drake just missed the treasure fleet by only half a day though through no fault of his own then with constantly diminishing numbers of effective men the course was shaped for the spanish plantation of st augustine in florida this place was utterly destroyed and some guns and money were taken from it then the fleet stood north again till on the ninth of june it found raleigh's colony of roanoke ralph lane the governor was in his fort on the island ready to brave it out drake offered a free passage home to all the colonists but lane preferred staying and going on with his surveys and plantation drake then filled up a store-ship to leave behind with lane but a terrific three-day storm wrecked the store-ship and damped the colonists enthusiasm so much that they persuaded lane to change his mind the colonists embarked and the fleet then bore away for home though balked of much it had expected in the way of booty reduced in strength by losses and therefore unable to garrison any strategic point which would threaten the life of new spain its purely naval work was a true and glorious success when he arrived at plymouth drake wrote immediately to burleigh my very good lord there is now a very great gap opened very little to the liking of the king of spain this very great gap on the american side of the atlantic was soon to be matched by the still greater gap drake was to make on the european side by destroying the spanish armada and thus securing that mightiest of ocean highways through which the hosts of emigration afterwards poured into a land endowed with the goodly heritage of english liberty and the english tongue the year of drake's return one thousand five hundred and eighty six was no less troublous than its immediate predecessors the discovery of the babington plot to assassinate elizabeth and to place mary on the throne supported by scotland france and spain proved mary's complicity produced an actual threat of war from france and made the pope and philip gnash their teeth with rage the roman catholic allied powers had no sufficient navy and philip's credit was at its lowest ebb after drake's devastating raid 
the english were exultant east and west for the true report of a worthy fight performed in the voyage from turkey by five ships of london against eleven galleys and two frigates of the king of spain at pantalaria within the straits of gibraltar anno one thousand five hundred and eighty six was going the rounds and running a close second to drake's west india achievement the ignorant and thoughtless both then and since mistook this fight and another like it in one thousand five hundred and ninety to mean that english merchantmen could beat off spanish men of war nothing of the kind the english levanters were heavily armed and admirably manned by well-trained fighting crews and what these actions really proved if proof was necessary was that galleys were no match for broadsides from the proper kind of sailing ships turkey came into the problems of one thousand five hundred and eighty six in more than name for there was a vast diplomatic scheme on foot to unite the turks with such portuguese as would support antonio the pretender to the throne of portugal and the rebellious dutch against spain catholic france and mary stuart's scotland leicester was in the netherlands with an english army fighting indecisively losing sir philip sidney and angering elizabeth by accepting the governor-generalship without her leave and against her diplomacy which now as ever was opposed to any definite avowal that could possibly be helped meanwhile the great armada was working up its strength and drake was commissioned to weaken it as much as possible but on the eighth of february one thousand five hundred and eighty seven before he could sail mary was at last beheaded and elizabeth was once more entering on a tricky course of torturous diplomacy too long by half to follow here as the great crisis approached it had become clearer and clearer that it was a case of kill or be killed between elizabeth and mary and that england could not afford to leave marian enemies in the rear when there might be a vast catholic alliance in the front but as a sovereign elizabeth disliked the execution of any crowned head as a wily woman she wanted to make the most of both sides and as a diplomatist she would not have open war and direct operations going down to the root of the evil if devious ways would do so the peace party of the council prevailed again and drake's orders were changed he had been going as a lion the peace party now tried to send him as a fox but he stretched his instructions to their utmost limits and even defied the custom of the service by holding no council of war when deciding to swoop on cadiz as they entered the harbour the english saw sixty ships engaged in preparations for the great armada many had no sails to keep the crews from deserting others were waiting for their guns to come from italy ten galleys rowed out to protect them the weather and surroundings were perfect for these galleys but as they came end on in line abreast drake crossed their t in line ahead with the shattering broadsides of four queen's ships which soon sent them flying each galley was the upright of the t each english sailing ship the corresponding cross piece then drake attacked the shipping and wrecked it right and left next morning he led the pinnaces and boats into the inner harbour where they cut out the big galleon belonging to santa cruz himself the spanish commander-in-chief then the galleys got their chance again an absolutely perfect chance because drake's fleet was becalmed at the very worst possible place for sailing ships and the very best possible place for the well-oared galleys but even under these extraordinary circumstances the ships smashed the galleys up with broadside fire and sent them back to cover then the spaniards towed some fire-ships out but the english rowed for them threw grappling irons into them and gave them a turn that took them clear then for the last time the galleys came on as bravely but as uselessly as ever when drake sailed away he left the shipping of cadiz completely out of action for months to come though fifteen sail escaped destruction in the inner harbour his own losses were quite insignificant the next objective was cape st vincent so famous through centuries of naval history because it is the great strategic salient thrust out into the atlantic from the southwest corner of europe and thus commands the flank approaches to and from the mediterranean to and from the coast of africa and in those days the route to and from new spain by way of the azores here drake had trouble with burrow his second in command a friend of cautious burley and a man hidebound in the warfare of the past a sort of english don burrow objected to drake's taking decisive action without the vote of a council of war 
remembering the terrors of italian textbooks he had continued to regard the galleys with much respect in the harbour of cadiz even after drake had broken them with ease finally still clinging to the old ways of mere raids and reprisals he stood aghast at the idea of seizing cape st vincent and making it a base of operations drake promptly put him under arrest sagra's castle commanding the roadstead of cape st vincent was extraordinarily strong the cliffs on which it occupied about a hundred acres rose sheer two hundred feet all round except at a narrow and well defended neck only two hundred yards across drake led the stormers himself while half his eight hundred men kept up a continuous fire against every spaniard on the wall the other half rushed piles of faggots in against the oak and iron gate drake was foremost in this work carrying faggots himself and applying the first match for two hours the fight went on when suddenly the spaniards sounded a parley their commanding officer had been killed and the woodwork of the gate had taken fire in those days a garrison that would not surrender was put to the sword when captured so these spaniards may well be excused drake willingly granted them the honours of war and so even to his own surprise the castle fell without another blow the minor forts near by at once surrendered and were destroyed while the guns of sagras were thrown over the cliffs and picked up by the men below the whole neighboring coast was then swept clear of the fishing fleet which was the main source of supply used for the great armada the next objective was lisbon the headquarters of the great armada one of the finest harbors in the world and then the best fortified of all taking it was of course out of the question without a much larger fleet accompanied by an overwhelming army but drake reconnoitred to good effect learnt wrinkles that saved him from disaster two years later and retired after assuring himself that an armada which could not fight him then could never get to england during the same season ship fevers and all the other epidemics that dogged the old sailing fleets and scourged them like the plague never waited long drake was soon short-handed to add to his troubles burrow sailed away for home whereupon drake tried him and his officers by court-martial and condemned them all to death this penalty was never carried out for reasons we shall soon understand since no reinforcements came from home cape st vincent could not be held any longer there was however one more stroke to make the great east india spanish treasure ship was coming home and drake made up his mind to have her off the azores he met her coming towards him and dipping her colours again and again to ask him who he was but he would put out no flag till we were within shot of her when we hanged out flag streamers and pendants which done we hailed her with cannon shot and having shot her through divers times she shot at us then we began to ply her hotly our fly-boat lightly armed supply vessel of comparatively small size and one of our pinnaces lying athwart her hawes across her bows at whom she shot and threw fireworks incendiary missiles but did them no hurt in that her ordnance lay so high over them then she seeing us ready to lay her aboard range up alongside all of our ships plying her so hotly and resolutely determined to make short work of her they yielded to us the spaniards fought bravely as they generally did but they were only naval amateurs compared with the trained professional sea-dogs the voyage was now made in the old sense of that term for this prize was the greatest ship in all portugal richly laden to our happy joy the relative values then and now are impossible to fix because not only was one dollar the equivalent in most ways of ten dollars now but in view of the smaller material scale on which men's lives were lived these ten dollars might themselves be multiplied by ten or more without producing the same effect as the multiplied sum would now produce on international affairs suffice it to say that the ship was worth nearly five million dollars of actual cash and ten twenty thirty or many more millions if present sums of money are to be considered relatively to the national incomes of those poorer days but better than spices jewels and gold were the secret documents which revealed the dazzling profits of the new east india trade by sea from that time on for the next 
twelve years the london merchants and their friends at court worked steadily for official sanction in this most promising direction at last on the thirty first of december one thousand six hundred the documents captured by drake produced their result and the east india company by far the greatest corporation of its kind the world has ever seen was granted a royal charter for exclusive trade drake may therefore be said not only to have set the course for the united states but to have actually discovered the route leading to the empire of india now peopled by three hundred million subjects of the british crown so ended the famous campaign in one thousand five hundred and eighty seven popularly known as the singeing of king philip's beard beyond a doubt it was the most consummate work of naval strategy which up to that time all history records end of chapter eight chapter nine of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine drake and the spanish armada with fifteen hundred and eighty eight the final crisis came philip haughty gloomy and ambitious philip unskilled in arms but persistent in his plans sat in his palace at madrid like a spider forever spinning webs that enemies tore down drake and the english had thrown the whole scheme of the armada's mobilization completely out of gear philip's well-intentioned orders and counter-orders had made confusion worse confounded and though the spanish empire held half the riches of the world it felt the lack of ready money because english sea-power had made it all parts and no whole for several months together then when mobilization was resumed philip found himself distracted by expert advice from santa cruz his admiral and from parma alva's successor in the netherlands the general idea was to send the invincible armada up the english channel as far as the netherlands where parma would be ready with a magnificent spanish army waiting aboard troopships for safe conduct into england the spanish regulars could then hold london up to ransom or burn it to the ground so far so good but philip to whom amphibious warfare remained an unsolved mystery thought that the armada and the spanish army could conquer england without actually destroying the english fleet he could not see where raids must end and conquest must begin most spaniards agreed with him parma and santa cruz did not parma as a very able general wanted to know how his oversea communications could be made quite safe santa cruz as a very able admiral knew that no such sea road could possibly be safe while the ubiquitous english navy was undefeated and at large some time or other a naval battle must be won or parma's troops cut off from their base of supplies and surrounded like an island by an angry sea of enemies must surely perish when first at sea and then on land said the expert warriors santa cruz and parma get into hated england with the least possible fighting risk or loss said the mere politician philip and then crush drake if he annoys you early and late persistent philip slaved away upon this enterprise of england with incredible toil he spun his web anew the ships were collected into squadrons the squadrons at last began to wear the semblance of a fleet but semblance only there were far too many soldiers and not nearly enough sailors instead of sending the fighting fleet to try to clear the way for the troop ships coming later on philip mixed army and navy together the men of war were not bad of their kind but the kind was bad they were floating castles high out of the water crammed with soldiers some other landsmen and stores and with only light ordnance badly distributed so as to fire at rigging and superstructures only not at the halls 
as the English did. Yet this was not the worst. The worst was that the fighting fleet was cumbered with troop ships which might have been useful in boarding, but which were perfectly useless in fighting of any other kind. And the English men of war were much too handy to be laid aboard by the lubberly Spanish troop ships. Santa Cruz worked himself to death. In one of his last dispatches, he begged for more and better guns. All Philip could do was to authorize the purchase of whatever guns the foreign merchantmen in Lisbon Harbor could be induced to sell. Sixty second-rate pieces were obtained in this way. Then, worn out by work and worry, Santa Cruz died and philip forced the command on a most reluctant landlubber the duke of medina sidonia a very great grandee of spain but wholly unfitted to lead a fleet the death of santa cruz in whom the fleet and army had great confidence nearly upset the whole enterprise of england the captains were as unwilling to serve under bandy-legged c six sidonia as he was unwilling to command them volunteering ceased compulsion failed to bring in the skilled ratings urgently required the sailors were now not only fewer than ever sickness and desertion had been thinning their ranks but many of these few were unfit for the higher kinds of seamanship while only the merest handful of them were qualified as seamen gunners philip however was determined and so the doomed armada struggled on fitting its imperfect parts together into a still more imperfect whole until in june it was as ready as it ever could be made meanwhile the english had their troubles too these were also political but the english navy was of such overwhelming strength that it could stand them with impunity the queen after thirty years of wonderful if torturous diplomacy was still disinclined to drop the art in which she was supreme for that in which she counted for so much less and by which she was obliged to spend so very much more there was still a little peace party also bent on diplomacy instead of war negotiations were opened with parma at flushing and diplomatic feelers went out towards philip who sent back some of his own but the time had come for war the stream was now too strong for either elizabeth or philip to stem or even divert into minor channels lord howard of effingham as lord high admiral of england was charged with the defence at sea it was impossible in those days to have any great force without some great nobleman in charge of it because the people still looked on such men as their natural viceroys and commanders but just as sir john norreys the most expert professional soldier in england was made chief of the staff to the earl of leicester ashore so drake was made chief of the staff to howard afloat which meant that he was the brain of the fleet a directing brain was sadly needed not that brains were lacking but that some one man of original and creative genius was required to bring the modern naval system into triumphant being like all political heads elizabeth was sensitive to public opinion and public opinion was ignorant enough to clamour for protection by something that a man could see besides which there were all those weaklings who had been described as the old women of both sexes in all ages and who have always been the nuisance they are still adding together the old views of warfare which nearly everybody held and the human weaknesses we have always with us there was a most dangerously strong public opinion in favour of dividing up the navy so as to let enough different places actually see that they had some visible means of divided defence the thirtieth of march fifteen hundred and eighty eight is the day of days to be remembered in the history of sea power because it was then that drake writing from plymouth to the queen in council first formulated the true doctrine of modern naval warfare especially the cardinal principle that the best of all defence is to attack your enemy's main fleet as it issues from its ports 
This marked the birth of the system perfected by Nelson, and thence passed on with many new developments to the British Grand Fleet in the great war of today. The first step was by far the hardest, for Drake had to convert the Queen and Howard to his own revolutionary views. He at last succeeded, and on the 7th of July sailed for Corona, where the Armada had rendezvoused after being dispersed by a storm. Every man afloat knew that the hour had come. Yet Elizabeth, partly on the score of expense, partly not to let Drake snap her apron strings completely, had kept the supply of food and even of ammunition very short, so much so that Drake knew he would have to starve or else replenish from the Spanish fleet itself. As he drew near Corona, on the 8th, the Spaniards were again reorganizing. Hundreds of perfectly useless landlubbers shipped at Lisbon to complete the absurdly undermanned ships were being dismissed at Corona. On the ninth, when Sidonia assembled a council of war to decide whether to put to sea or not, the English van was almost in sight of the coast. But then the north wind flawed, failed, and at last chopped round. A roaring sou'wester came on, and the great strategic move was over. On the 12th, the fleet was back in Plymouth, replenishing as hard as it could. Howard behaved to perfection. Drake worked the strategy and tactics. But Howard had to set the tone, afloat and ashore, to all who came within his sphere of influence, and right well he said it. His dispatches at this juncture are models of what such documents should be, and their undaunted confidence is in marked contrast to what the doomed Spanish officers were writing at the selfsame time. The southwest wind that turned Drake back brought the armada out and gave it an advantage which would have been fatal to England had the fleets been really equal or the Spaniards in superior strength for a week was a very short time in which to replenish the stores that Elizabeth had purposely kept so low. Drake and Howard, so the story goes, were playing a game of bowls on Plymouth Hoe on Friday afternoon, the 19th of July, when Captain Fleming of the Golden Hind rushed up to say the Spanish fleet was off the Lazard, only sixty miles away. All eyes turned to Drake. Divining the right way to calm the people, he whispered an order, and then said out loud, There's time to end our game, and beat the Spaniards too. The shortness of food and ammunition that had compelled him to come back, instead of waiting to blockade, now threatened to get him nicely caught in the very trap he had wished to catch the great armada in himself for the Spaniards coming up with the wind might catch him struggling out against the wind and crush his long emerging column bit by bit precisely as he had intended crushing their own column as it issued from the Tagus or Corona. But it was only the van that Fleming had sighted. Many a Spanish straggler was still hauled down astern, and Sidonia had to wait for all to close and form up properly meanwhile drake and howard were straining every nerve to get out of plymouth it was not their fault but the queen's in council that sidonia had unwittingly stolen this march on them it was their glory that they won the lost advantage back again all afternoon and evening all through that summer night the sea-dog crews were warping out of harbour torches flares and cressets through their fitful light on toiling lines of men hauling on ropes that moved the ships apparently like snails but once in plymouth sound the whinnying sheaves and long yo hoes told that all the sail the ships could carry was being made for a life-or-death effort to win the weather gauge thus beat the heart of naval england that momentous night in plymouth sound while beacons blazed from height to height ashore horsemen spurred off post-haste with orders and dispatches and every able-bodied landsman stood to arms next morning drake was in the channel near the eddystone with fifty-four sail when he sighted a dim blur to windward through the thickening mist and drizzling rain this was the great armada 
rain came on and killed the wind all sail was taken in aboard the english fleet which lay under bare poles invisible to the spaniards who still announced their presence with some show of canvas in actual size and numbers the spaniards were superior at first but as the week-long running fight progressed the english evened up with reinforcements spanish vessels looked bigger than their tonnage being high built and spanish official reports likewise exaggerated the size because their system of measurement made their three tons equal to an english four in armament and seamen gunners the english were perhaps five times as strong as the armada and seamen gunners won the day the english seamen greatly outnumbered the spanish seamen utterly surpassed them in seamanship and enjoyed the further advantage of having far handier vessels to work the spanish grand total for all ranks and ratings was thirty thousand men the english only fifteen but the spaniards were six thousand short on arrival and their actual seamen many of whom were only half trained then numbered a bare seven thousand the seventeen thousand soldiers only made the ships so many death traps for they were of no use afloat except as boarding parties and no boarding whatever took place the english fifteen thousand on the other hand were three-quarter seamen and one-quarter soldiers who were mostly trained as marines and this total was actually present on the whole it is hardly an exaggeration to say that the armada was mostly composed of armed transports while all the english vessels that counted in the fighting were real men of war in every one of the armada's hundred and twenty-eight vessels says an officer of the spanish flagship our people kneeled down and offered a prayer beseeching our lord to give us victory against the enemies of his holy faith the crews of the hundred and ninety-seven english vessels which at one time or another were present in some capacity on the scene of action also prayed for victory to the lord of hosts but took the proper naval means to win it trust in the lord and keep your powder dry said oliver cromwell when about to ford a river in the presence of the enemy and so in other words said drake all day long on that fateful twentieth of july the visible armada with its swinging canvas was lying to fifteen miles west of the invisible bare-masted english fleet sidonia held a council of war which landsmen like believed that the english were divided one half watching parma the other the armada the trained soldiers and sailors were for the sound plan of attacking plymouth first some admirals even proposed the only perfect plan of crushing drake in detail as he issued from the sound all were in blissful ignorance of the astounding feat of english seamanship which had already robbed them of the only chance they ever had but philip also landsmanlike had done his best to thwart his own armada for sidonia produced the royal orders forbidding any attack on england till he and parma had joined hands drake however might be crushed piecemeal in the offing when still with his aftermost ships in the sound so with this true idea unworkable because based on false information the generals and admirals dispersed to their vessels and waited but then just as night was closing in the weather lifted enough to reveal drake's astonishing position immediately pinnaces went scurrying to sidonia for orders but he had none to give at one in the morning he learnt some more dumbfounding news that the english had nearly caught him at Corona that drake and howard had joined forces and that both were now before him nor was even this the worst for while the distracted sidonia was getting his fleet into the eagle formation so suitable for galleys whose only fighting men were soldiers the english fleet was stealing the weather gauge his one remaining natural advantage an english squadron of eight sail manoeuvred coastwise on the armada's inner flank while unperceived by the spanish lookout drake stole away to sea beat round its outer flank and then making the most of a westerly slant in the shifting breeze edged into starboard the spaniards saw nothing till it was too late 
Drake having given them a berth just wide enough to keep them quiet. But when the sun rose there, only a few miles off to windward, was the whole main body of the English fleet coming on in faultless line ahead, heeling nicely over on the port tack before the freshening breeze, and far from waiting for the great armada, boldly bearing down to the attack. With this consummate move, the victory was won. The rest was slaughter, borne by the Spaniards with a resolution that nothing could surpass. With dauntless tenacity, they kept their eagle formation so useful at Lepanto through seven dire days of most one-sided fighting. Whenever occasion seemed to offer, the Spaniards did their best to close, to grapple, and to board as had their heroes at lepanto but the english merely laughed ran in just out of reach poured in a shattering broadside between wind and water stood off to reload fired again with equal advantage at longer range caught the slow galleons end on raked them from stem to stern passed to and fro in one long deadly line ahead concentrating at will on any given target and did all this with well-nigh perfect safety to themselves in quite a different way close to but to the same effect at either distance long or short the english had the range of them as sailors say to-day close to the little spanish guns fired much too high to hull the english vessels lying low and trim upon the water with whose changing humours their lines fell in so much more happily than those of any lumbering spaniards could far off the little spanish guns did correspondingly small damage even when they managed to hit while the heavy metal of the english handled by real seamen gunners inflicted crushing damage in return but even more important than the englishmen's superiority in rig hull armament and expert seamanship was their tactical use of the thoroughly modern line ahead any one who will take the letter t as an illustration can easily understand the advantage of crossing his t the upright represents an enemy caught when in column ahead as he would be for instance when issuing from a narrow-necked port in this formation he can only use bow fire and that only in succession on a very narrow front but the fleet represented by the cross-piece moving across the point of the upright is in the deadly line ahead with all its near broadsides turned in one long converging line of fire against the helplessly narrow-fronted enemy if the enemy sticking to mediaeval tactics had room to broaden his front by forming column abreast as galleys always did that is with several uprights side by side he would still be at the same sort of disadvantage for this would only mean a series of tees with each nearest broadside crossing each opposing upright as before the herded soldiers and non-combatants aboard the great armada stood by their useless duties to the last thousands fell killed or wounded several times the spanish scuppers actually ran a horrid red as if the very ships were bleeding the priests behaved as bravely as the jesuits of new france and who could be braver than those undaunted missionaries were soldiers and sailors were alike what shall we do now asked sidonia after the slaughter had gone on for a week order up more powder said aquendo as dauntless as before even then the eagle formation was still kept up the van ships were the head the biggest galleons formed the body lighter vessels formed the wings a reserve formed the tail as the unflinching armada stood slowly up the channel a sail or two would drop out by the way dead beat one night several strange sail passed suddenly by drake what should he do to go about and follow them with all astern of him doing the same in succession was not to be thought of as his aftermost vessels were merchantmen wholly untrained to the exact combined manoeuvres required in a fighting fleet though first-rate individually there was then no night signal equivalent to the modern disregard the flagship's movements so drake doused his stern light went about overhauled the strangers and found they were bewildered german merchantmen he had just gone about once more to resume his own station when suddenly a spanish flagship loomed up beside his own flagship the revenge drake immediately had his pinnace 
lowered away to demand instant surrender but the spanish admiral was don pedro de valdez a very gallant commander and a very proud grandee who demanded terms and though his flagship which had been in collision with a run amuck seemed likely to sink he was quite ready to go down fighting yet the moment he heard that his summoner was drake he surrendered at discretion feeling it a personal honour according to the ideas of the age to yield his sword to the greatest seaman in the world with forty officers he saluted drake complimenting him on valour and felicity so great that mars and neptune seemed to attend him as also on his generosity towards the fallen foe a quality often experienced by the spaniards whereupon adds this eye-witness sir francis drake requiting his spanish compliments with honest english courtesies placed him at his own table and lodged him in his own cabin drake's enemies at home accused him of having deserted his fleet to capture a treasure-ship for there was a good deal of gold with valdez but the charge was quite unfounded a very different charge against howard had more foundation the armada had anchored at calais to get its breath before running the gauntlet for the last time and joining parma in the netherlands but in the dead of night when the flood was making and a strong west wind was blowing in the same direction as the swirling tidal stream nine english fire-ships suddenly burst into flame and made for the spanish anchorage there were no boats ready to grapple the fire-ships and tow them clear there was no time to weigh for every vessel had two anchors down sidonia enraged that the boats were not out on patrol gave the order for the whole fleet to cut their cables and make off for their lives as the great lumbering hulls which had of course been riding head to wind swung round in the dark and confusion several crashing collisions occurred next morning the armada was strung along the flemish coast in disorderly flight seeing the impossibility of bringing the leewardly vessels back against the wind in time to form up sidonia ran down with the windward ones and formed farther off howard then led in pursuit but seeing the capitana of the renowned italian galeasses in distress near calais he became a mediaeval knight again left his fleet and took the galeasse for the moment that one feather in his cap seemed better worth having than a general victory drake forged ahead and led the pursuit in turn the spaniards fought with desperate courage still suffering ghastly losses but do what they could to bear up against the english and the wind they were forced to leeward of dunkirk and so out of touch with parma this was the result of the battle of grave lines fought on monday the twenty ninth of july fifteen hundred and eighty eight just ten days after captain fleming had rushed on to the bowling green of plymouth hoe where drake and howard their short work done were playing a game before embarking in those ten days the gallant armada had lost all chance of winning the overlordship of the sea and shaking the sea-dog grip off both americas a rising gale now forced it to choose between getting pounded to death on the shoals of dunkirk or running north through the north sea in which the british grand fleet of the twentieth century fought against the fourth attempt in modern times to win a world dominion north and still north round by the surf-lashed orkneys then down the wild west coasts of the hebrides and ireland went the forlorn armada losing ships and men at every stage until at last the remnant straggled into spanish ports like the mere wreckage of a storm End of chapter nine chapter ten of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the one and the fifty three the next year fifteen hundred and eighty nine is famous for the unsuccessful lisbon expedition drake had the usual troubles with elizabeth who wanted him to go about picking leaves and breaking branches before laying the axe to the root of the tree though there were in the narrow seas defensive squadrons strong enough to ward off any possible blow yet the nervous landsmen wanted corunna and other ports attacked and their shipping destroyed for fear england should be invaded before drake could strike his blow at lisbon 
then there were troubles about stores and ammunition the english fleet had been reduced to the last pound of powder twice during the ten days battle with the armada yet elizabeth was again alarmed at the expense of munitions she never quite rose to the idea of one supreme and finishing blow no matter what the cost might be this was a joint expedition the first in which a really modern english fleet and army had ever taken part with sir john norreys in command of the army there was no trouble about recruits for all men of spirit flocked in to follow drake and norreys the fleet was perfectly organized into appropriate squadrons and flotillas such as then corresponded with the battleships cruisers and mosquito craft of modern navies the army was organized into battalions and brigades with a regular staff and all the proper branches of the service the fleet made for corona where norreys won a brilliant victory a curious little incident of exact punctilio is worth recording after the battle and when the fleet was waiting for a fair wind to get out of the harbor the ships were much annoyed by a battery on the heights norreys undertook to storm the works and sent in the usual summons by a parlementaire accompanied by a drummer an angry spaniard fired from the walls and the drummer fell dead the english had hostages on whom to take reprisals but the spaniards were too quick for them within ten minutes the guilty man was tried inside the fort by drumhead court-martial condemned to death and swung out neatly from the walls while a polite spanish officer came over to assure the english troops that such a breach of discipline should not occur again lisbon was a failure the troops landed and marched over the ground north of lisbon where wellington in a later day made works whose fame has caused their memory to become an allusion in english literature for any impregnable base the lines of torres vedras the fleet and the army now lost touch with each other and that was the ruin of them all norreys was persuaded by don antonio pretended to the throne of portugal which philip had seized to march farther inland where portuguese patriots were said to be ready to rise en masse this antonio was a great talker and a first-rate fighter with his tongue but his portuguese followers also great talkers wanted to see a victory won by arms before they rose before leaving lisbon drake had one stroke of good luck a spanish convoy brought in a hanseatic dutch and german fleet of merchantmen loaded down with contraband of war destined for philip's new armada drake swooped on it immediately and took sixty well-found ships then he went west to the azores looking for what he calls some comfortable little dew of heaven that is of course more prizes of a richer kind but sickness broke out the men died off like flies storms completed the discomfiture and the expedition got home with a great deal less than half its strength in men and not enough in value to pay for its expenses it was held to have failed and drake lost favour with the sun of drake's glory in eclipse at court and with spain and england resting from warfare on the grander scale there were no more big battles the following year but the year after that fifteen hundred and ninety one is rendered famous in the annals of the sea by sir richard grenville's fight in drake's old flagship the revenge this is the immortal battle of the one in the fifty-three from which raleigh's prose and tennyson's verse have made a glory of the pen fit to match the glory of the sword grenville had sat with drake and sir philip sidney on the parliamentary committee which recommended the royal charter granted to sir walter raleigh for the founding of the first english colony in what is now the united states grenville's grandfather marshal of calais to henry the eighth had the faculty of rhyme and in a set of verses very popular in their own day showed what the grenville family ambitions were who seeks the way to win renown or flies with wings to high desire who seeks to wear the laurel crown or hath the mind that would aspire let him his native soil eschew let him go range and seek anew 
grenville himself was a wild and roving blade no great commander but an adventurer of the most daring kind by land or sea he rather enjoyed the consternation he caused by aping the airs of a pirate king he had a rough way with him at all times and ralph lane was much set against his being the commander of the virginia voyage of which lane himself was the governor on land but in action he always was beyond a doubt the very beau ideal of a first-class fighting man a striking instance of his methods was afforded on his return from virginia when he found an armed spanish treasure-ship ahead of him at sea he had no boat to board her with but he knocked some sort of one together out of the ship's chests and sprang up the spaniard's side with his boarding party just as this makeshift boat was sinking under them the last fight of the revenge is almost incredible from the odds engaged fifty-three vessels to one but it is true and neither raleigh's glowing prose nor tennyson's glowing verse exaggerates it lord thomas howard almost famished for want of prey had been cruising in search of treasure ships when captain middleton one of the gentlemen adventurers who followed the gallant earl of cumberland came in to warn him that don alonzo de bazan was following with fifty-three sail the english crews were partly ashore at the azores and howard had barely time to bring them off cut his cables and work to windward of the overwhelming spaniards grenville's men were last the revenge had only her hundred fighters on deck and her ninety-six below when the spanish fleet closed round him yet just as he had sworn to cut down the first man who touched a sail when the master thought there was still a chance to slip through so now he refused to surrender on any terms at all then running down close hauled on the starboard tack decks cleared for action and crew at battle quarters he steered right between two divisions of the spanish fleet till the mountain-like san philippe of fifteen hundred tons ranging up on his weather side blanketed his canvas and left him almost becalmed immediately the vessels which the revenge had weathered hauled their wind and came up on her from to leeward then at three o'clock in the afternoon of the first of september fifteen hundred and ninety one that immortal fight began the first broadside from the revenge took the san philippe on the water line and forced her to give way and stop her leaks then two spaniards ranged up in her place while two more kept station on the other side and so the desperate fight went on all through that afternoon and evening and far on into the night meanwhile howard still keeping the weather gauge attacked the spaniards from the rear and thought of trying to cut through them but his sailing master swore it would be the end of all her majesty's ships engaged as it probably would so he bore away wisely or not as critics may judge for themselves one vessel the little george noble of london a victualler stood by the revenge offering help before the fight began but grenville thanking her gallant skipper ordered him to save his vessel by following howard with never less than one enemy on each side of her the revenge fought furiously on boarders away shouted the spanish colonels as the vessels closed repel boarders shouted grenville in reply and they did repel them time and again till the english pikes dripped red with spanish blood a few spaniards gained the deck only to be shot stabbed or slashed to death towards midnight grenville was hit in the body by a musket shot fired from the tops the same sort of shot that killed nelson the surgeon was killed while dressing the wound and grenville was hit in the head but still the fight went on the revenge had already sunk two spaniards a third sank afterwards and a fourth was beached to save her but grenville would not hear of surrender when day broke not ten unwounded englishmen remained the pikes were broken the powder was spent the whole deck was a wild entanglement of masts spars sails and rigging the undaunted survivors stood dumb as their silent cannon but every spanish hull in the whole encircling ring of death bore marks of the revenge's rage four hundred spaniards by their own admission had been killed and quite six hundred wounded one hundred englishmen had thus accounted for a thousand spaniards besides all those that sank 
grenville now gave his last order sink me the ship master gunner but the sailing master and flag captain both wounded protesting that all lives should be saved to avenge the dead manned the only remaining boat and made good terms with the spanish admiral then grenville was taken very carefully aboard don bazan's flagship where he was received with every possible mark of admiration and respect don bazan gave him his own cabin the staff surgeon dressed his many wounds the spanish captains and military officers stood hat in hand wondering at his courage and stout heart for that he showed not any signs of faintness nor changing of his colour grenville spoke spanish very well and handsomely acknowledged the compliments they paid him then gathering his ebbing strength for one last effort he addressed them in words they have religiously recorded here die i richard grenville with a joyful and quiet mind for that i have ended my life as a true soldier ought to do that hath fought for his country queen religion and honour wherefore my soul most joyfully departeth out of this body and when he had said these and other such like words he gave up the ghost with a great and stout courage grenville's latest wish was that the revenge and he should die together and though he knew it not he had this wish fulfilled for two weeks later when don bazan had collected nearly a hundred more sail around him for the last stage home from the west indies a cyclone such as no living man remembered burst full on the crowded fleet not even the great armada lost more vessels than don bazan did in that wreck engulfing week no less than seventy went down and with them sank the shattered revenge beside her own heroic dead drake might be out of favour at court the queen might grumble at the sad extravagance of fleets diplomats might talk of untying gordian knots that the sword was made to cut courtiers and politicians might wonder with which side to curry favour when it was an issue between two parties peace or war the great mass of ordinary landsmen might wonder why the sea affair was a thing they could not understand but all this was only the mint and cumin of imperial things compared with the exalting deeds that drake had done for once the english sea-dogs had shown the way to all america by breaking down the barriers of spain england had ceased to be merely an island in a northern sea and had become the mother country of such an empire and republic as neither record nor tradition can show the like of elsewhere and england felt the triumph she thrilled with pregnant joy poet and proseman both gave voice to her delight hear this new note of exultation born of england's victory on the sea as god hath combined the sea and land into one globe so their mutual assistance is necessary to secular happiness and glory the sea covereth one half of this patrimony of man thus should man at once lose the half of his inheritance if the art of navigation did not enable him to manage this untamed beast and with the bridle of the winds and the saddle of his shipping make him serviceable now for the services of the sea they are innumerable it is the great purveyor of the world's commodities the conveyor of the excess of rivers uniter by traffic of all nations it presents the eye with divers colours and motions and is as it were with rich brooches adorned with many islands it is an open field for merchandise in peace a pitched field for the most dreadful fights in war yields diversity of fish and fowl for diet material for wealth medicine for sickness pearls and jewels for adornment the wonders of the lord in the deep for all instruction multiplicity of nature for contemplation to the thirsty earth fertile moisture to distant friends pleasant meeting to weary persons delightful refreshing to studious minds a map of knowledge a school of prayer meditation devotion and sobriety refuge to the distress portage to the merchant customs to the prince passage to the traveller springs lakes and rivers to the earth it hath tempests and calms to chastise sinners and exercise the faith of seamen manifold affections to stupefy the supplest philosopher maintaineth as in our island a wall of defence and watery garrison to guard the state it entertains the sun with vapours the stars with a natural looking-glass the sky with clouds the air with temperateness the soil with suppleness the rivers with tides the hills with moisture the valleys with fertility but why should i longer detain you the sea yields action to the body meditation to the mind and the world to the world by this art of arts navigation
Well might this pious Englishman, the Reverend Samuel Purchase, exclaim with David, Thy ways are in the sea, and thy paths in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. The poet sang of Drake in England, too. Could this encompassment of all the world be more happily admired than in these four short lines? The stars of heaven would thee proclaim, if men here silent were, the sun himself could not forget his fellow traveller. What wonder that after Nombre, the Dios, and the Pacific, the West Indies and the Spanish Main, Cadiz and the Armada, what wonder after this that Shakespeare, English to the core, rings out, this royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war this happy breed of men this little world this precious stone set in the silver sea which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happy lands this blessed plot this earth this realm this england this england never did nor never shall lie at the proud foot of a conqueror but when it first did help to wound itself now these her princes are come home again come the three corners of the world in arms and we shall shock them naught shall make us rue if england to herself do rest but true end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Elizabethan Dogs by William Wood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: Raleigh and the Vision of the West. Conquerors first, prospectors second, then the pioneers. That is the order of those by whom America was opened up for English-speaking people. No Elizabethan colonies took root therefore the age of elizabethan sea-dogs was one of conquerors and prospectors not one of pioneering colonists at all spain and portugal alone founded sixteenth-century colonies that have had a continuous life from those days to our own virginia and new england like new france only began as permanent settlements after drake and queen elizabeth were dead Virginia in 1607, New France in 1608, New England in 1620. It is true that Drake and his sea dogs were prospectors in their way. So were the soldiers, gentlemen adventurers, and fighting traders in theirs. On the other hand, some of the prospectors themselves belonged to the class of conquerors, while many would have gladly been the pioneers of permanent colonies. Nevertheless, the prospectors form a separate class, and Sir Walter Raleigh, though an adventurer in every other way as well, is undoubtedly their chief. His colonies failed. He never found his El Dorado. He died a ruined and neglected man, but still he was the chief of those whom we can only call prospectors, first because they tried their fortune ashore, one step beyond the conquering sea-dogs, and secondly because their fortune failed them just one step short of where the pioneering colonists began a man so various that he seemed to be not one but all mankind's epitome is a description written about a very different character but it is really much more appropriate to sir walter raleigh courtier and would-be colonizer soldier and sailor statesman and scholar poet and master of prose raleigh had one ruling passion greater than all the rest combined in a letter about america to sir robert cecil the son of queen elizabeth's principal minister of state lord burleigh he expressed this great determined purpose of his life i shall yet live to see it an english nation he had other interests in abundance perhaps in superabundance and he had much more than the usual temptations to 
lived the life of fashion with just enough of public duty to satisfy both the queen and the very least that is implied by the motto noblesse oblige he was splendidly handsome and tall a perfect blend of strength and grace full of deep romantic interest in great things far and near the very man whom women dote on and yet through all the seductions of the court and all the storm and stress of europe he steadily pursued the vision of that west which he would make an english nation he left oxford as an undergraduate to serve the huguenots in france under admiral coligny and the protestants in holland under william of orange like hawkins and drake he hated spain with all his heart and paid off many a score against her by killing spanish troops at smerwick during an irish campaign marked by ruthless slaughter on both sides on his return to england he soon attracted the charmed attention of the queen his spreading his cloak for her to tread on lest she might wet her feet is one of those stories which ought to be true if it's not in any case he won the royal favour was granted monopolies promotion and estates and launched upon the full flood stream of fortune he was not yet thirty when he obtained for his half-brother sir humphrey gilbert then a man of thirty-eight a royal commission to inhabit and possess all remote and heathen lands not in the possession of any christian prince the draft of gilbert's original prospectus dated at london the sixth of november fifteen seventy seven and still kept there in the record office is an appeal to elizabeth in which he proposed to discover and inhabit some strange place gilbert was a soldier and knew what fighting meant so he likewise proposed to set forth certain ships of war to the new land which with your good license i will undertake without your majesty's charge the new land fish is a principal and rich in everywhere vendable merchandise and by the gain thereof shipping victual munition and the transporting of five or six thousand soldiers may be defrayed but gilbert's associates cared nothing for fish and everything for gold he went to the west indies lost a ship and returned without a fortune next year he was forbidden to repeat the experiment the project then languished until the fatal voyage of fifteen eighty three when gilbert set sail with six vessels intending to occupy newfoundland as the base from which to colonize southwards until an armed new england should meet and beat new spain how vast his scheme how pitiful its execution and yet how immeasurably beyond his wildest dreams the actual development to-day gilbert was not a sea-dog but a soldier with an uncanny reputation for being a regular jonah who had no good hap at sea he was also passionately self-willed and elizabeth had doubts about the propriety of backing him but she sent him a gilt anchor by way of good luck and off he went in june financed chiefly by raleigh whose name was given to the flagship gilbert's adventure never got beyond its base in newfoundland his ship the delight was wrecked the crew of the raleigh mutinied and ran her home to england the other four vessels held on but the men for the most part were neither good soldiers good sailors nor yet good colonists but ne'er-do-wells and desperadoes by september the expedition was returning broken down gilbert furious at the sailor's hints that he was just a little sea shy would persist in sticking to the lilliputian ten-ton squirrel which was woefully top hampered with guns and stores before leaving newfoundland he was implored to abandon her and bring her crew aboard a bigger craft but no do not fear he answered we are as near to heaven by sea as land one wild night off the azores the squirrel foundered with all hands amadis and barlow sailed in fifteen eighty four prospecting for sir walter raleigh they discovered several harbors in north carolina then part of the vast 
plantation of virginia roanoke island pamlico and albemarle sounds as well as the intervening waters were all explored with enthusiastic thoroughness and zeal barlow a skipper who was handy with his pen described the scent of that fragrant summer land in terms which attracted the attention of bacon at the time and of dryden a century later the royal charter authorizing raleigh to take what he could find in this strange land had a clause granting his prospective colonists all the privileges of free denizens and persons native of england in such ample manner as if they were born and personally resident in our said realm of england next year sir richard grenville who was raleigh's cousin convoyed out to roanoke the little colony which ralph lane governed and which as we have seen in an earlier chapter drake took home discomfited in fifteen eighty six there might have been a story to tell of successful colonization instead of failure if drake had kept away from roanoke that year or if he had tarried a few days longer for no sooner had the colony departed in drake's vessels than a ship sent out by sir walter raleigh freighted with all manner of things in most plentiful manner arrived at roanoke and after some time spent in seeking our colony up in the country and not finding them returned with all the aforesaid provision into england about a fortnight later sir richard grenville himself arrived with three ships not wishing to lose possession of the country where he had planted a colony the year before he landed fifteen men in the isle of roanoke furnished plentifully with all manner of provision for two years and so departed for england grenville unfortunately had burnt an indian town and all its standing corn because the indians had stolen a silver cup lane too had been severe in dealing with the natives and they had turned from friends to foes these and other facts were carefully recorded on the spot by the official chronicler thomas harriet better known as a mathematician among the captains who had come out under grenville in fifteen eighty five was thomas cavendish a young and daring gentleman adventurer greatly distinguished as such even in that adventurous age and the second english leader to circumnavigate the globe when drake was taking lane's men home in june fifteen eighty six cavendish was making the final preparations for a two-year voyage he sailed mostly along the route marked out by drake and many of his adventures were of much the same kind his prime object was to make the voyage pay a handsome dividend but he did notable service in clipping the wings of spain he raided the shipping off chile and peru took the spanish flagship the famous santa anna off the coast of california and on his return home in fifteen eighty eight had the satisfaction of reporting i burned and sank nineteen sail of ships both small and great and all the villages and towns that ever i landed at i burned and spoiled while cavendish was preying on spanish treasure in america and drake was singeing the king of spain's beard in europe raleigh still pursued his colonizing plans in fifteen eighty seven john white and twelve associates received incorporation as the governor and assistants of the city of raleigh in virginia the fortunes of this ambitious city were not unlike those of many another boomed and busted city of much more recent date no time was lost in beginning three ships arrived at roanoke on the twenty second of july fifteen eighty seven every effort was made to find the fifty men left behind the year before by grenville to hold possession for the queen mounds of earth which may even now be traced so piously have their last remains been cared for mark the site of the fort from natives of croatoan island the newcomers learned that grenville's men had been murdered by hostile indians one native friend was found in mantio a chief whom barlow had taken to england and grenville had brought back 
Mantillo was now living with his own tribe of sea coast Indians on Croatoan Island. But the mischief between red and white had been begun, and though Mantillo had been baptized and was recognized as the lord of Roanoke, the races were becoming fatally estranged. After a month, Governor White went home for more men and supplies, leaving most of the colonists at Roanoke. He found Elizabeth, Raleigh, and the rest all working to meet the great armada. Yet even during the following year, the momentous year of 1588, Raleigh managed to spare two pinnaces with fifteen colonists aboard, well provided with all that was most needed. A Spanish squadron, however, forced both pinnaces to run back for their lives. After this frustrated attempt, two more years passed before White could again sail for Virginia. In August 1590, his trumpeter sounded all the old familiar English calls as he approached the little fort. No answer came. The colony was lost forever white had arranged that if the colonists should be obliged to move away they should carve the name of the new settlement on the fort or surrounding trees and if there was either danger or distress they should cut across above the one word croatoan was all white ever found there was no cross white's beloved colony white's favorite daughter and her little girl were perhaps in hiding but supplies were running short White was a mere passenger on board the ship that brought him, and the crew were getting impatient, so impatient for refreshment and a Spanish prize that they sailed past Croatoan, refusing to stop a single hour. Perhaps White learnt more than is recorded and was satisfied that all the colonists were dead. Perhaps not. Nobody knows. Only a wandering tradition comes out of that impenetrable mystery and circles round the not impossible romance of young Virginia Dare. Her father was one of White's twelve assistants. Her mother, Eleanor, was White's daughter. Virginia herself, the first of all true native-born americans was born on the eighteenth of august fifteen eighty seven perhaps mantio lord of roanoke saved the whole family whose name has been commemorated by that of the north carolina county of dare perhaps virginia dare alone survived to be an indian queen about the time the first permanent anglo-american colony was founded in sixteen hundred and seven twenty years after her birth who knows? These twenty sundering years from the end of this abortive colony in 1587 to the beginning of the first permanent colony in 1607 constitute a period that saw the close of one age and the opening of another in every relation of Anglo-American affairs. Nor was it only in Anglo-American affairs that change was rife. The Honorable East India Company entered upon its wonderful career shakespeare began to write his immortal plays the chosen translators began their work on the authorized version of the english bible the puritans were becoming a force within the body politic as well as in religion ulster was planted with englishmen and lowland scots in the midst of all these changes the great queen grown old and very lonely died in sixteen hundred and three and with her ended the glorious tudor dynasty of england james pusillanimous and pedantic son of darnley and mary queen of scots ascended the throne as the first of the sinister stuarts and truckling to vindictive spain threw raleigh into prison under suspended sentence of death there was a break of no less than fifteen years in english efforts to colonize america nothing was tried between the last attempt at roanoke in fifteen eighty seven and the first attempt in massachusetts in sixteen hundred and two when thirty-two people sailed from england with bartholomew gosnold formerly a skipper in raleigh's employ gosnold made straight for the coast of maine which he sighted in may he then coasted south to cape cod continuing south he entered buzzards bay where he landed on cuttyhunk island 
here on a little island in a lake an island within an island he built a fort round which the colony was expected to grow but supplies began to run out there was bad blood over the proper division of what remained the would-be colonists could not agree with those who had no intention of staying behind the result was that the entire project had to be given up gosnold sailed home with the whole disgusted crew and a cargo of sassafras and cedar such was the first prospecting ever done for what is now new england the following year sixteen hundred and three just after the death of queen elizabeth some merchant venturers of bristol sent out two vessels under martin pring like gosnold pring first made the coast of maine and then felt his way south unlike gosnold however he bore into the great gulf of massachusetts bay where he took in a cargo of sassafras at plymouth harbor but that was all the prospecting done this time there was no attempt at colonizing two years later another prospector was sent out by a more important company the earl of southampton and sir ferdinando gorgeous were the chief promoters of this enterprise gorgeous as lord proprietary of the province of maine is a well-known character in the subsequent history of new england lord southampton as shakespeare's only patron and greatest personal friend is forever famous through the world the chief prospector chosen by the company was george weymouth who landed on the coast of maine explored a little of the surrounding country kidnapped five indians and returned to england with a glowing account of what he had seen the cumulative effect of the three expeditions of gosnold pring and weymouth was a revival of interest in colonization prominent men soon got together and formed two companies which were formally chartered by king james on the tenth of april sixteen hundred and six the first or southern colony which came to be known as the london company because most of its members lived there was authorized to make its first plantation at any place upon the coast of virginia or america between the four and thirty and one and forty degrees of latitude the northern or second colony afterwards called the plymouth company was authorized to settle any place between thirty eight degrees and forty five degrees north thus overlapping both the first company to the south and the french to the north in the summer of the same year sixteen hundred and six henry challens took two ships of the plymouth company round by the west indies where he was caught in a fog by the spaniards later in the season pring went out and explored north virginia in may sixteen hundred and seven a hundred and twenty men under george popham started to colonize this north virginia in august they landed in maine at the mouth of the kennebec where they built a fort some houses and a pinnace finding themselves short of provisions two-thirds of their number returned to england late in the same year the remaining third passed a terrible winter popham died and raleigh gilbert succeeded him as governor when spring came all the survivors of the colony sailed home in the pinnace they had built and the enterprise was abandoned the reports of the colonists after their winter in maine were to the effect that the second or northern colony was not habitable for englishmen in the meantime the permanent foundation of the first or southern colony the real virginia was well under way the same number of intending emigrants went out a hundred and twenty on the twenty sixth of april sixteen hundred and seven about four o'clock in the morning we described the land of virginia the same day we entered into the bay of chesapeake chesapeake thus begins the tale of captain john smith of the founding of jamestown and of a permanent virginia the first of the future united states now that we have seen one spot in vast america really become the promise of the english nation which raleigh had longed for we must return once more to raleigh himself as mocked by his tantalizing vision he looked out on a changing world from his secular mount pisgah in the prison tower of london 
by this time he had felt both extremes of fortune to the full during the travesty of justice at his trial the attorney-general having no sound argument covered him with slanderous abuse these are three of the false accusations on which he was condemned to death viperous traitor damnable atheist and spider of hell hawkins drake frobisher and grenville all were dead so raleigh last of the great elizabethan lions was caged and baited for the sport of spain six of his twelve years of imprisonment were lightened by the companionship of his wife elizabeth throgmorton most beautiful of all the late queen's maids of honour another solace was the history of the world the writing of which set his mind free to wander forth at will although his body stayed behind the bars but the contrast was too poignant not to wring this cry of anguish from his preface yet when we once come in sight of the port of death to which all winds drive us and when by letting fall that fatal anchor which can never be weighed again the navigation of this life takes end then it is i say that our own cogitations those sad and severe cogitations formerly beaten from us by our health and felicity return again and pay us to the uttermost for all the pleasing passages of our life past at length in the spring of sixteen sixteen raleigh was released though still unpardoned he and his devoted wife immediately put all that remained of their fortune into a new venture twenty years before this he thought he could make discovery of the mighty rich and beautiful empire of guiana and of that great and golden city which the spaniards called el dorado and the natives called manoa now he would go back to find the el dorado of his dreams somewhere inland that mysterious manoa among those southern mountains of bright stones which lay behind the spanish main the king's cupidity was roused and so in sixteen seventeen raleigh was commissioned as the admiral of fourteen sail in november he arrived off the coast that guarded all the fabled wealth still lying undiscovered in the far recesses of the orinocan wilds guiana manoa el dorado the inland voices called him on but spaniards barred the way and raleigh defying the instructions of the king attacked them the english force was far too weak and disaster followed raleigh's son and heir was killed and his lieutenant committed suicide his men began to mutiny spanish troops and ships came closing in and the forlorn remnant of the expedition on which such hopes were built went straggling home to england there raleigh was arrested and sent to the block on the twenty ninth of october sixteen eighteen he had played the great game of life and death and lost it when he mounted the scaffold he asked to see the axe feeling the edge he smiled and said tis a sharp medicine but a cure for all diseases then he bared his neck and died like one who had served the great queen as her captain of the guard End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Elizabethan Sea Dogs by William Wood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: Drake's End. Drake in disfavor after fifteen hundred and eighty-nine seems a contradiction that nothing can explain. It can, however, be quite easily explained, though never explained away he had simply failed to make the lisbon expedition pay a heinous offence in days when the navy was as much a revenue department as the customs or excise he had also failed to take lisbon itself the reasons why mattered nothing either to the disappointed government or to the general public but six years later in fifteen ninety five when drake was fifty and hawkins sixty three england called on them both to strike another blow 
at spain elizabeth was helping henry the fourth of france against the league of french and spanish catholics henry astute as he was gallant had found paris worth a mass and to elizabeth's dismay had gone straight over to the church of rome with terms of toleration for the huguenots the war against the holy league however had not yet ended the effect of henry's conversion was to make a more united france against the encroaching power of spain and every eye in england was soon turned on drake and hawkins for a stroke at spanish power beyond the sea drake and hawkins formed a most unhappy combination made worse by the fact that hawkins now old beyond his years soured by misfortune and staled for the sea by long spells of office work was put in as a check on drake in whom elizabeth had lost her former confidence sir thomas baskerville was to command the troops here at least no better choice could have possibly been made baskerville had fought with rare distinction in the breast campaign and before that in the netherlands there was the usual hesitation about letting the fleet go far from home the purely defensive school was still strong elizabeth in certain moods belonged to it and an incident which took place about this time seemed to give weight to the argument of the defensivists a small spanish force obliged to find water and provisions in a hurry put into mouse hole in cornwall and finding no opposition burnt several villages down to the ground the moment these spaniards heard that drake and hawkins were at plymouth they decamped but this ridiculous raid threw the country into doubt or consternation elizabeth was as brave as a lion for herself but she never grasped the meaning of naval strategy and she was supersensitive to any strong general opinion however false drake and hawkins with baskerville's troops all in transports and many supply vessels for the west india voyage were ordered to cruise about ireland and spain looking for enemies the admirals at once pointed out that this was the work of the channel fleet not that of a joint expedition bound for america then just as the queen was penning an angry reply she received a letter from drake saying that the chief spanish treasure ship from mexico had been seen in puerto rico little better than a wreck and that there was time to take her if they could only sail at once the expedition was on the usual joint stock lines and elizabeth was the principal shareholder she swallowed the bait whole and sent sailing orders down to plymouth by return and so on the twenty eighth of august fifteen ninety five twenty five hundred men in twenty seven vessels sailed out bound for new spain surprise was essential for new spain taught by repeated experience was well armed and twenty five hundred men were less formidable now than five hundred twenty years before arrived at the canaries las palmas was found too strong to carry by immediate assault and drake had no time to attack it in form he was two months late already so he determined to push on to the west indies when drake reached puerto rico he found the spanish in a measure forewarned and forearmed though he astonished the garrison by standing boldly in the harbor and dropping anchor close to a masked battery the real surprise was now against him the spanish gunners got the range to an inch brought down the flagship's mizzen knocked drake's chair from under him killed two senior officers beside him and wounded many more in the meantime hawkins worn out by his exertions had died this reception added to the previous failures and the astonishing strength of puerto rico produced a most depressing effect drake weighed anchor and went out he was soon back in a new place cleverly shielded from the spanish guns by a couple of islands 
after some more manoeuvres he attacked the spanish fleet with fireballs and by boarding when a burning frigate lit up the whole wild scene the spanish gunners and musketeers poured into the english ships such a concentrated fire that drake was compelled to retreat he next tried the daring plan of running straight into the harbour where there might still be a chance but the spaniards sank four of their own valuable vessels in the harbour mouth guns stores and all just in the nick of time and thus completely barred the way foiled again drake dashed for the mainland seized la hacha burnt it ravaged the surrounding country and got away with a successful haul of treasure then he seized santa marta and nombre de dios both of which were found nearly empty the whole of new spain was taking the alarm the dragons back again meanwhile a fleet of more than twice drake's strength was coming out from spain to attack him in the rear nor was this all for baskerville and his soldiers who had landed at nombre de dios and started overland were in full retreat along the road from panama having found an impregnable spanish position on the way it was a sad beginning for fifteen ninety six the centennial year of england's first connection with america since our return from panama he never carried mirth nor joy in his face wrote one of baskerville's officers who was constantly near drake a council of war was called and drake making the best of it asked which they would have Truxillo, the port of honduras or the golden towns round about lake nicaragua both answered baskerville one after the other so the course was laid for san juan on the nicaragua coast a head wind forced drake to anchor under the island of veragua a hundred and twenty-five miles west of nombre de dios bay and right in the deadliest part of that fever-stricken coast the men began to sicken and die off drake complained at table that the place had changed for the worse his earlier memories of new spain were of a land like a pleasant and delicious arbor very different from the vast and desert wilderness he felt all round him now the wind held foul more and more men lay dead or dying at last drake himself the man of iron constitution and steel nerves fell ill and had to keep his cabin then reports were handed in to say the stores were running low and that there would soon be too few hands to man the ships on this he gave the order to weigh and take the wind as god had sent it so they stood out from that pestilential mosquito gulf and came to anchor in the fine harbour of puerto bello which the spaniards had chosen to replace the one at nombre de dios twenty miles east here in the night of the twenty seventh of january drake suddenly sprang out of his berth dressed himself and raved of battles fleets armadas plymouth hoe and plots against his own command the frenzy passed away he fell exhausted and was lifted back to bed again then like a christian he yielded up his spirit quietly his funeral rites befitted his renown the great new spanish fort of puerto bello was given to the flames as were nearly all the spanish prizes and even two of his own english ships for there were now no sailors left to man them thus amid the thunder of the guns whose voice he knew so well and surrounded by consuming pyres afloat and on the shore his body was committed to the deep while muffled drums rolled out their last salute and trumpets wailed his requiem end of chapter twelve end of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood